Hello, chaps and chapettes. Welcome to another episode of the Guitar Geeks podcast. Thank you for tuning in once again. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you check out Guitar Geeks on all streaming platforms. And if you're on all streaming platforms, make sure you check out the video version on YouTube. So I have a wonderful special guest this week, fresh off new release with his band Insurgent, which is absolutely sick. Very heavy, pro proggy metal riff, so you will all enjoy it if you're a listener on the podcast. So Joe Rowley from Insurgent, welcome to the show. How are you doing, my friend? It's quite a good introduction. I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. I'm not too bad. Can't complain on this cloudy Thursday afternoon. Yeah, no, oh. Oh, what a, what a start! My internet, <laughs> my internet decides it's going to uh, play up. What a what a what a way of chatting for like 15, 20 minutes before, and then the internet decides it's going to do some, <laughs> do some jumps. We are experiencing technical difficulties. <laughs> You'll have to hotspot yeah, with your like, phone yeah. if a push comes to shove. <laughs> so how you doing? Oh god, yeah, no, it's. Uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm just uh, been busy. Uh, so just busy with the band, you know, like getting some, uh, we've been, obviously we've had this music that recorded for a while now. So um, it's just been about like um, contacting like press, you know, press agents and getting this distribution sorted. And it's just been quite hectic trying to, and it always feels like, you know, we get something sorted and then there's another thing like, oh, you got to do this by the way, or like uh, you got to, you know, um, and it's, it's all a learning, it's a bit of a learning curve because it's, you know, we're, we're trying to talk do it all properly this time and really get the right people behind it and it's um so i've been busy with that and then writing new music um kind of getting back into the swing of writing some new stuff um so that's that's going well we've been jamming a few new ideas as a band um sounding really cool a bit more we're kind of we feel like this ep is like the it's like the core of our sound and then we've written a few more songs that kind of branch out a bit like one that's a little cleaner obviously it gets being us it gets a bit heavier towards the end but like it's very much an upward trajectory from like the clean to the heavier stuff and then we've got a few more technically challenging uh sort of ideas um one, one that's in one that's a bit more low tuning stuff as well so like you know a bit of trying to vary it up a bit um, a bit of chunk. Never teach guitar as well huh? bit of chunk <laughs> yeah yeah well i've got the uh i've got this um this mayonnaise and it's just like it's just sitting there in drop a like, and, and I bear in mind, I, I've got my PRS as well. And this, I bought this a little while ago and got it. That's the, re is, got, it the is it the Regis? Is it the Regis or the Sigis or and, something um, like that? Yeah, it's the Regis. Uh, it's the Regis Pro. I don't know what ra the different range names are. I know Regis is like that model. I don't know with Pro. With yeah. so many things, Pro is just like the beginner model. I don't, I don't even know what it is. <laughs> but, um, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a really cool guitar. And I've, I had it sat in A for a while I've, I've just i'm just like i've got like a few grand's worth of guitar there sat in drop a i need to write some stuff with it and so i've had a few cool ideas um again some more yeah branching out from the sound a bit just keeping busy with that and then uh then i've been teaching i teach guitar so um in case anyone wants a lesson you know there you go um but uh but yeah i've been teaching guitar for the best part of a year now um with covid and that it just kind of um it was actually quite a good excuse to really it's a good way to get out of the bar job because like I just did the online, I was furloughed, so I was like, well, I'll do the online teaching. Um, and that just went really well. So I've, I've got quite a few students now. Some of them have got a good few that are into their metal, you know, into the heavy metal side of things. So into the dark side. So that's good. I enjoy that. Just I've got a couple that just want to write metal songs. It's like, that's great. That's just what I do in my own time anyway. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that's that's a dream really, isn't it? Being paid to do what you want to do. So, um, Quitting. so yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, we're right. It's, it's funny. And sometimes it, I, I find it weirdly, I, I'd never, well, I say I'd never admit it to the student, I would, but I find it weirdly useful helping them write stuff because I have to explain how, you know, sometimes things that I wouldn't necessarily think about, I have to explain to them. Um, so like little concepts like, okay, we're going to take inspiration from this guy. Um, and I have to actually think about, and it's actually, it's made me think about my writing a bit more and just generally playing from the teaching. So it's been really useful as well. I found when I have uh, students, because yeah, like no, just... when I've taught lessons, they kind of, they always get very flustered like we did when we first started. The whole mm -hmm. concept is very daunting. And um, I, I do two things that I find has worked really well with students. And one is turn your guitar the other way around, because then you have no concept of what you're doing. Even though oh. you know what to play, you, your hands don't work. Yeah same way and i think that kind of yeah, translates it yeah. quite well 
<laughs> yeah, mine definitely don't. <laughs> yeah. And um, secondly, I always say, like, I don't start off by going, oh, this is a C chord, this is a D chord, this is a G chord, this is a blah, blah, blah. I'll say, OK, what do you listen to? What's your favourite songs? What do you want to learn? And then because then I find that the, they tend to stick to it more if they're learning stuff yeah. that they enjoy personally. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting with the I've never thought to like flip the guitar around like that because I, I know lefties are really good at that. The amount of guys that I've bumped into are yeah, left handed guitar players. There's one I know, uh, who, uh, his name is uh, Declan that I follow on Instagram and he, he plays left handed, but um, I'm pretty sure they all just have to learn right handed anyway because it's just like a, it's, it's just like it's where all the, you know, all the good guitars, are, you know, you can get left handed guitars, but like they're just sort of there's so few compared to the amount of right handed ones. and. The amount I know that can just flip the guitar and play it right-handed is crazy. You know, I couldn't, well, I couldn't even think to swap it round. My uncle's left-handed, but he plays guitar right-handed. And when I was chatting to Mike Demas the other week, and he was saying he's actually yeah. right-handed, but the only guitar he had at the time was a left-handed guitar, and that's how he's and he's oh. he's, he's stuck to it since. That's that's yeah. I mean, the uh, I saw them at download the other week actually, and that was that was awesome. They're yeah, doing, doing that Newport helicopter. And <laughs> when that starts going off, it's mad. That's mad. And then looking at the like the aerial shots of it, uh, uh not the aerial shots, but like the stage shots of it, um, watching that back is just mental. Like, you, I feel like as a live band, you if you want to be really good, you need that one thing that, like, you mm. know. Um, I feel like you know Slipknot have got their like you know spit it out right at the end where everyone like gets down on the ground. I know that's not their thing. Like a lot of bands do that. Although I feel like a lot of bands do that since Slipknot did it. Really yeah, well. I think Slipknot yeah. kind of started it, and then all the other yeah, bands you can't really followed. Put, you can't really pattern people getting on the floor and getting up again. Like it's not that <laughs> it's just not that creative, but it, it's cool. And it, it I remember you know I remember my first gig, like my first proper gig, as a sort of young adult was Slipknot, um, which was you know a bit of a sort of. Um, was a baptism of fire you know like getting into metal music and then the first gig is slipknot and i remember i was just stood near the front and then jim roots like his his silhouette just appears on stage you know i was like oh that's so cool and then like and then the whole audience just starts moving and i just couldn't even sorry just get ambulances going by here all the time. <laughs> and i um and i just i just started moving like, i just couldn't not like i was just being pushed around and i just it wasn't even a mosh pit i just like could not move and that's that's the kind of live show it's just like yeah if you could ever get anywhere near like something like that that would be crazy because that you know that kind of total i remember like when jim root popped up on stage and he was like my absolute hero at the time he still is one of them to be fair um and i remember looking thinking like that's just the cool i will never forget that like him just jumping up because it was the way the lighting was it was as if it was just his silhouette on stage um you know he's got the beard and the mask and he's, he's which tour did you see them on uh, it was the uh, the gray chapter it was 2016 at Alex, uh, ali pally uh yeah yeah um, which was, and it was, yeah. And that was my first gig as like an adult. I, I saw Bon Jovi when I was about 13. And then, uh, which was awesome. That was on a beach in Belgium. I would, um, I would really like to see Bon Jovi. They're one of they the bands great. that I've still not seen that I would really enjoy seeing. I'm just yeah, looking that, that somewhere because I've got in my little collection of picks and odd sorts, I've oh, yeah. actually got one of Mick Thompson's picks here somewhere. Ah, oh, there it is. There how, it could is. You, how could you just bundle that in with the rest of your picks? I'd have to have that. That'd be for me. That'd be like you know, framed in glass. <laughs> you know, that's wicked. I've got that one. I've got one from Hetfield and Kirk Hammett and oh, God, crazy. That's cool. A couple of Ramstein ones. I can, the best I can do, I think I've got Josh Rand's. You know, from Stone Sour. Oh uh, yeah. Grab one of his at one point on their tour. I th I'm sure I've got another one of. Oh, I can't remember what it is now. I'm not that good on the merch side or the, uh, you know, I've not been front row enough times. It's always when they throw the drumsticks, you're like, is it going to be me? And it never is. It never is. <laughs> I've never caught a drumstick yet. No, I don't know anyone that's ever caught one actually either. So um, yeah, never had any, any luck on that front. But. Whenever I go to a gig, I'm more, I always pretty much try front row. I mean, uh, my first ever gig was busted. And it was just That's like, awesome. <laughs> it was like right in the fucking back. Like, you know, you had to get your binoculars out to kind of see what was going on. Um, yeah. Cause I my parents love them as a kid. I still yeah. do. I still do. Oh I'm no, not I'm, not I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying I'm just got bad since then. No, I remember. Uh, uh, yeah. I used to love them. I think that was the first CD I ever got. I can't remember what. Yeah. What you said no when it was. was something like were... that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it had like, uh, it just had all the hits on it, you know, like it, um, but I remember, yeah, I used that's, I think that's probably what got me into 
I mean, that and sort of that probably got me into guitar music from a young age. You know, I got into that. Like, and yeah, you, know, you just the guitar's there. It's not like a it's not like a big feature, but it's it's there. Yeah, it's like it's um, it's kind of it's it. There's a lot of obviously you know it's very popular music, but there's a lot of pop music that the guitar it might be a layer, but it's not really a, a feature. Whereas yeah. the guitar, it's kind of in busted. It's it, yeah, it's it's kind of like what like, what would you call it? Kind of pop rock, rock pop rock, a bit of punky sort of influence, but not really. Yeah, like you really um, got like so, um, undertones sort of vibes from them you know from back in like you know like the 80s rock almost yeah. you know punky sort of era yeah yeah and i that, that i think that's probably looking back at it that was a, a big thing that got me into that kind of music just going that way and then like fallout boy as well i got into them when i was yeah. Young. um yeah yeah and i still kind of like them to be fair i don't really i don't really listen to them much if the song, if the song comes up especially if i've had a few drinks that's exo to that yeah like sugar we're going down or something like that you know, if that comes up if that comes up at like half three in the morning in the club because you, know, it you can't you, you, know, you just can't help it can you because yeah, everybody yeah. starts singing it yeah um so that yeah those those two that was i suppose a convenient segue into into a relevant guitar sort of conversation but the, well the, yeah because uh, yeah, usually i start off saying where did the music journey start for you and bits and pieces but we've yeah. kind of transitioned into it quite yeah, nicely that made for it yeah no I, I, yeah i think it was that to be fair um i mean yeah that and then also my dad's kind of uh my dad used to play the guitar a lot i i, I keep trying to get him to pick him up pick it up again but he insi- he, he's insistent that he won't um but yeah he he used to play a, you know a lot like hours and hours a day um when i was a kid so obviously it was just it, it was around the house i heard it a lot and um and i remember kind of yeah i think fallout boy and busted were like what yeah when i was just like you know seven or eight maybe nine kind of got me into it. but then i remember uh I, I can't remember how old i was i think it was about 11 when i actually got bought a guitar for like a, I think it was a birthday present and uh but i remember not long before that i, I was given the ozzy osbourne tribute album you know the uh the one it's like the randy rhodes uh sort of feature it's got all of his like yeah uh, most of it it didn't have uh like diary of a madman or that one but i think it had like most of randy rhodes big tracks and that was and watch i don't know if you've seen the live videos of ozzy and his silly blue and silver jumps yeah. and doing like crazy train and and um uh, uh mr crowley and i was just in awe at randy rhodes with his massive guitar that's way too big for him <laughs> like, uh, well i always look back at that especially the mr crowley like mr crowley when you just see how big the guitar is it's like randy rhodes just been like four foot nothing <laughs> It's like it's like you know when you, you know like when you're at school and some of the kids go to school and like the backpacks about like half the size of them. <laughs> <laughs> the year seven like students. It's, yeah, the yeah, yeah, all the new students and the, the backpacks are like you know like down by their knees and up above their head. Like, what, what, what are you even carrying that? And it yeah, and it's like <laughs> a weird comparison, but there you go. But that, yeah, I remember seeing you know, see Randy Rhodes and he's got this massive V, the polka dot V with the. Yeah. Top. Um, like the barbed sort of uh, headstock, and that 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 was to me. I mean, hearing like Crazy Train and that that solo, the live version. There's very, it's not often I find that you hear a live, particularly a solo, where you think that's actually better than the recording. And yeah. I think what he did in that in those two live session or that one live session with Crazy Train. I think they also did like I don't know or something like that. Um, those two solos, he just puts these little things in there that are just so like in the moment amazing mm. that they, they just think oh i wish he'd done that on the recording because he, i can't you can't like splice them together someone should i don't know how you could do it but you know there's probably be a way like there's one. probably some like really good producer out there that would probably be able to do it but it's like when um gary moore did uh still got the blues that main solo yeah. in that was just like a one take improvisation piece and it's just i, know, I always I, it some, sort of terrifies me when you hear that you're like how how do you, you know, I, I, I'm currently, there's a song, actually, and this is another one, we're writing a new song uh, that I'm going to have a solo in, which is new, because we haven't, the, there's, I mean, spoiler alert, there's no solos on the EP. Um, <laughs> sorry uh, for all you uh, uh, elitists yeah, out for, there. <laughs> for all 12 people that were hoping for one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's there's, there's going to be a, um, th- there'll be a, a solo on one of our newer songs, and, um, and I'm kind of sort of crafting it, you know, I'm about, hard, I, I, I've got like the structure of, I've got the structure for like which what I want each part to be like and it's not a it's a sort of medium length solo it's not just like a short little flash and it's not like some virtuoso part it's like a happy medium I think and um it, I've got I've got the structure of it and I've got like I think I've got the body of like the first half 
Um, and then the second half gets a bit more technical. So it's like I'm trying to getting that note for note part is tricky. Um, and then when you hear people say like this was this was improvised or like I just I just fail to believe them sometimes. You know, like, <laughs> how do you? I couldn't even think to do that. I think there's a couple that come to mind. Was the uh, I don't if you heard the new alluvial stuff. No. Oh man, you've got to check that out because that's crazy. Where's Where's How's a crazy guitar player? But I think um, I was I was listening. To, uh, you know, Brandon Ellis, the guitar uh, Black Dahlia Murder. I think he's yeah. Person. He's got a solo on one of their tracks, and I remember his. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I suppose you haven't heard it, but no. But apparently, he improvised a lot of that, and you listen to it like, what? How on earth? It's got so many like modal ideas and you know like interesting phrasing you think how did you improvise that like i just don't i don't even know and then uh, kiko Lorero, um i don't know if you heard conquer or die by Megadeth. Yeah. that was another one that yeah. supposedly was sort of semi-improvised like, how? it's so quick how do, you, how do you just improvise? <laughs> i can improvise slowly you know and i can play quickly but not improvise not particularly i've, really. I've definitely changed i think especially in the last sort of five years you know when i when i first picked up a guitar and i'd see people like kirk Hammett and whatnot and you just look and you think oh wow that's amazing but now like i've very much gone away from lead and i i much prefer just that real tight rhythm now compared to playing lead personally yeah i'm i'm the same i i'm, I'm getting more interested i think because like in terms of scope in terms of like looking at what i want to get out of a guitar career i th- for me the best metal guitarist ever is dimebag and i think like it's because he did rhythm and the lead and he was he was stand out on both of them like head and shoulders above i think pretty much anyone um and i think even still to this day like he i don't know if, there are a few people that maybe give him a run for his money and you know like if you have sort of uh preferences like for who you really like as a guitar player then yeah sure you might you might prefer them but for me like Mark subjective my favorite guitar player yeah but like in terms of who i think is the best in terms of metal if i had to say it'd probably be time bag i think um unpopular opinion i'm gonna state this on the camera on. now and i know i'm gonna get like, I'm about to leave the call <laughs> i can't stand dime bag i absolutely can't stand Why? him Why? i think okay, you better have a good reason for this <laughs> i think one he had one of the worst guitar tones of all time oh, yeah, i but, think his oh, guitar okay. tone is horrible and i personally think pantera a bunch of homophobic racists and um, for that reason yeah, yeah, i, I, I don't issues like them around that, yeah. and so I, I don't listen to pantera sorry youtube and spotify world shoot yeah, me no i mean yeah there's that i know, I know that's, a, that's a bit of a difficult issue isn't it because it's very like i know phil anselmo's run into trouble with some stuff he's done so mm. i don't, you can't say i condone that but um yeah, I, I don't know, with Dimebag, I, to be fair, all, all I've heard from Dimebag, when you've heard about people talking about him personally, you, you only ever hear pretty amazing things about him as a person. You know, I don't know whether, I don't know about his more sort of uh, questionable views. I don't know whether, you know, obviously he's unfortunately dead now, so no one's, no one's had the chance to ask him. But um, but yeah, I mean, just on pure guitar playing, that I, I think he's standout, you know, metal guy. I think Mark Tremonti's my hero, like my guitar hero. And that's where that's where the inspiration comes from, and I hope that comes across in the EP. That that kind of that the more the more sort of uh, like for me, Dimebag I think is like the really really cool in terms of his. I don't know what I guess it's quite groundbreaking stuff, but in terms of like you talk about like subjective kind of preferences, like Tremonti's music just kind of hits home for me. So that's kind of what I try to keep trying to give Tremonti's like solo stuff listens but I can never get into it I mean I like a couple of songs by Alter Bridge and whatnot but I just Mm. yeah I've struggled to get the 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 thing about Tremonti again personally uh, I've I've struggled to find it yeah it's it's a weird um I think the thing that I that that gets me is it's like it's heavy but it's not like it's you know there's some of their songs the riffs if you were to put like some sort of you know like a really harsh vocalist on there and get a drummer like a sort of a you know proper full-on balls to the wall metal drummer there'd be some really nasty alter bridge songs you know um but because of the context because miles kennedy because of his vocal performance and then because more like the way they structure their songs it has this weird delivery where it's like heavy but it's not um Mm. you know it doesn't like i don't think it alienates the 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 more melody driven kind of fans, the ones who want to be able to sing along. Yeah. And that's like, to be fair, that is kind of what we aim for um, as a whole. And I think we, I guess we go a little heavier, maybe um, not that that's necessarily by default better, you know, but 
we, we go a bit heavier. The smile there says maybe you think it is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, Heavy is always good. Um, yeah. But, um, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, well, that's what we try and kind of follow is that, uh, like, heavy but. I guess heavy butt is almost the definition. It's like heavy butt dot dot dot. Like what you know, and that there's other adjectives. It's kind of what we're aiming for. Um, I guess it's like subjective heavy always has everybody pros and cons, will. isn't it? Yeah, and somebody will always constitute something like different as um, like really heavy. Like for me, there's heavy where you've got like you know, obviously for me. Ramstein's one of my favorite bands and this is sometimes oh, there's, awesome. a, there's a there's a particular riff that will just hit and it's just like uh that fart face oh, yeah. stank face and then you've got like Devin Townsend who will do a completely different style of heavy and that's then, like cinematic heavy isn't it yeah and then uh Metallica will give their own version of heavy and it's like you say it, it's yeah. all They've all got their own their own version aspects. according to however Lars wants to do it. <laughs> <laughs> China, 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 China. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. I, I I do. To be fair, I do. I do love Metallica. I, I I never. I don't know. People complain about certain things about them. No, don't get me wrong. There are a couple of questionable albums, but um, I think like their their overall. People say like, why didn't they do this or why didn't they do that? It's like, well, it wouldn't be them if they didn't. You know, everyone complains about like Injustice for All and the bass on that. I'm like, yeah, it would be cool, but it puts you in a place you know it puts you in a musical space that like fine yeah maybe technically it should have more bass on it or okay saint anger that's unforgivable but like but there's um, still some really good songs on on saint anger i I have i've tried i just really can't get past that snare jesus that snare is just so bad i don't (laughs) i just can't like i'm willing to like you know forgo certain things but that snare is just terrible there's a guy on youtube i can't remember his username i think i know exactly what you're gonna say yeah the guy that like re-recorded the whole album like drums guitars bass etc and he he basically remade the whole album himself but basically with a proper snare and it transforms the whole album Oh, I thought you were going to say, <laughs> I thought you were going to say the guy that played Bleed, but on his trigger, he put Lars's snare. <laughs> and it's just... Yes, I have seen that. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the worst thing in the world. And I wish the internet didn't exist. But um, <laughs> but yeah, I can't remember. I was going to say, I can't remember what I was going to say now. Something about Metallica. For me, and Justice for great. All is one of the like top five greatest ever albums. Like the technicality in that album like kirk yeah. is on literal oh, something like black as well that like oh yeah, i love black um that's what i was gonna ask i was gonna say what what would you put down as the heaviest band what do you think is the heaviest metal band at the moment at the moment i think it's really difficult to i think see past gajira i think gajira out there uh, I'm glad you said that. That's exactly what I was. Uh, say. Probably like one of the heaviest bands out there at the moment. Yeah. Um, I f- I think that Ginger have got a, a certain aspect on heavy, especially with Tatiana's vocals and the extreme yeah. prog guitar. Yeah, they've got a proper. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can see where I, I get. Sometimes they have a lot of uh, like blast beats and stuff in there, which those lose i can't name a single song where blast beats really excite me as a listener i don't know what it is i, I think me the problem I with it is that, but... I, I would say from that period of like 2007 to about 2012 blast beats you know there were bands that were just doing so- the whole songs with double bass and blast beats and you kind of lose the context mm. of it it's like doing the whole song just of gallop picking the brrrr, and you yeah, get bored yeah, of it yeah, yeah. but when how ginger utilize it and they have it sparingly it works a lot better oh yeah i think like trivium do it a bit as well where they have like this sparingly used yeah kind of stuff yeah and that, that's interesting i i um I think that's cool. I don't know. There are some times where I think it, it doesn't, it's not that I hate it. It just doesn't, I don't know. I always just, I always just think, could they not? I find it's lazy. Groove? I, don't, just, huh? I find it's lazy writing. I wouldn't, yeah, I don't even know. I, I'd hate to say that because there's so many brilliant writers that have used that kind of idea, you know. Um, I mean, like Gajira, you know. Yeah. Um, but the other heavy band I was going to say would be Meshuggah. Those two. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> if I had to pick like heaviest bands, you know, like something like Demiurge, that song is so. Oh, just... De- Demiurge is low key. It's the chromatic the best the way it just song. slips down and it's, oh, yeah, heavy. And uh, yeah, that, there's always a good stuff on that album. Yeah, like people always, when they say the sugar, they go, bleed. But I'm sorry, but like. That's not the heaviest song, yeah. That's no, it's like, cool. I am Colossus, like, do not look down. Um, like you say, Demiurge, like those three songs on those, Colossus yeah. are just. Um, what's oh. the one? Something about, uh, is it like the demon's name is surveillance or something, or the devil's name? It's so one of those. But that, that just, it's just considered, to, to be yeah. fair, we're joking about blast beats, and then the whole song is double kicks minus like 10 <laughs> seconds. Like quick, just um, quick 16th triplet double kicks. And it's just, I think that's what it is. Anyway. And I know uh, it's yeah. not technically a real band, but Death Clock, I think Death Clock are fucking heavy, but in a I really good way. I have heard them. I've heard the name. I don't think I've You've heard. never listened to Death Clock. Oh my God. I don't think so. Where have you there, there been? There are a few bands that I feel like I've just either not listened to or just never got. And I think that's probably one of them. I don't know. Have um, you never watched Metalocalypse then? No. I don't even think I've heard of that. Oh, man. You're right. Do, um, it's basically um, the drummer in it is Gene Holgan. Brendan Spall, He's he does like a lot of the, pretty much all the guitars. Uh, he does the vocals, but he it's basically like an animated metal cartoon series uh, of a fictional okay. band called awesome. Death called Death Clock, and some oh. of the the some of the songs in it are just fucking outstanding. It's but kind the, of like Tenacious D, but on steroids. Oh, kicks the ass of Tenacious D. Absolutely kicks the ass of no, Tenacious. No, no, hang on a minute. Nothing kicks the ass of Tenacious. D. Uh, <laughs> j- j- you, you start watching Death uh, Metal Apocalypse and listening to Death Clock, and like m- when you finish yeah. this podcast, go and listen to Mermaid or like Laser Cannon Death Sentence, or listen, yeah. and then you will go. Oh, it reminded me of a, a thing that uh, my stu- it's one of my students showed me yesterday, and it's um, it's a twenty four seven heavy metal stream but it's all ai generated and it's based off of i think arch spire and it's just it's ridiculous like it's just a it's it's been going for about two years and it's just this 20 it's like ai generated metal that just goes on forever it's it sounds awful <laughs> well not awful well, no it is awful it does sound awful it's like technical death metal and it's all like just randomly bot generated and it just keeps going i think the description or the tagline is like we want to eliminate humans from metal music or something that like sounds that. absolutely bizarre is, um, it's yeah like the internet is a weird place and uh, you know I, I, it made me laugh and i thought who spends their time doing that i mean you've got to be a smart guy to do that and then all of a sudden you just you're, you're on another career path <laughs> making ai <laughs> de- technical death metal music like what what went wrong we, all right, so we have massively digressed completely, yeah, sorry, yeah, no, no, yeah. but that, that's the whole point of the podcast, so yeah, yeah, it's yeah. cool. Um, so you touched upon your dad playing guitar yeah. when, uh, so when you were younger. So what was like the music in your household then when he was, you know, sort of playing guitar and when you was growing up? Uh, so, that yeah, I mean, it was... Um, that's a good question. I mean, it was kind of... My dad was just... Uh, or is it, you know he still is big on his kind of like uh hendrix uh sabbath like classic rock and metal uh like motorhead iron maiden uh oh do i think he has he has this big vinyl collection of sort of vinyls that would probably be worth a lot of money if he looked after them but they're just <laughs> uh they're, they're, they're kind of in i think they're probably still worth a little bit of money i mean like i imagine know, like, if they're yeah, original yeah, copies as well yeah, they are. Yeah, and I don't think he'd ever sell them. And I think, you know, eventually, obviously, one day they'll pass on to me, and I, I won't sell them. But, um, but yeah, I think um, it was. I'm trying to think what other. I distinctly remember hearing "Phantom of the Opera" by Iron Maiden. Um, that that being a really cool one. Hearing "Overkill" by Motorhead, all on vinyl. You know, with the crackle as it plays yeah. along. And, um, Hendrix, like hearing some original Hendrix stuff, like uh, "20th Century Boy" by T Rex, things like that. <laughs> Um, here, hey Joe, Jimi Hendrix, yeah, those kind of tunes. And I still wasn't like, I don't think I was massively swept away by them immediately because it's like as a kid, I think it's just not that. It's the kind of music you really have to have a bit of an understanding of. Like you don't have to be a musician, but you have to at least be able to appreciate it. And I think when you're like, you know, when you're sort of, what well, I mean, between the age of like four and eight, you know, that that kind of music is easily lost in you. I think. Yeah. Um, 
probably why I like busting Fallout Boy. Yeah, at the time. <laughs> but I think there was a connection. I think I was starting to clock it a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, and then after that, it would be that, as I mentioned, that that Ozzy, I got into Ozzy Osbourne. That was my dad showing me, I think, when almost certain showed me Ozzy Osbourne. I remember I'd, I'd show them to my mates and they just wouldn't get it. <laughs> like I had one friend who actually kind of quite liked it, even though he liked his just like gen- generic pop music at the time. You know, like the now the now sixty eight CDs. Oh God, yeah. Um, Fall Out Boy was on that, and I oh that was another one. I remember I got the Kerrang 08 album. Uh, the, the album. Oh, yeah, because they used to do album. like the yearly albums, didn't they? It's all bashed up in my car at the moment, but um, <laughs> I still have it. And uh, and yeah, it's got. There's a few tracks on there. There's uh, I remember being terrified of Psychosocial by Slipknot. Like genuinely, like this is scary, you know. Um, but then I, I loved. Uh, it was thirty seconds to Mars was on there. Uh, the kill was on there. That was good. Uh, Teenagers by My Chemical Romance. Um, and I remember, I distinctly remember asking my parents because, like, there's, there's, there's swearing on this, but I really want it, you know, <laughs> like because I was quite young, <laughs> and and I knew there was swearing on the songs, and, and I was, but I just kind of asked my parents, like, can I? Can... Oh, American Idiot, that was the one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Has, has the dreaded F word in it. And I, and I think I had to politely ask my parents, like, can I have it? I promise I won't say it, you know? <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, that, that was a massive thing, actually. That and the, the Aussie album, those two were, were huge. And then, um, yeah, in terms of music, and I think that, that pretty much sums up the music in my house. And then I kind of, then I ended up getting into like Pantera as well. Um, that was like, the, that was when I got weirdly heavy. I think I jumped like about yeah. eight hurdles of heavy. <laughs> say you jumped a big like 30, step there. Yeah, like 30 seconds to Mars all the way up to Pantera. And I have, I mean, obviously, audio listeners won't not see this, but um, I've got, this was me. I've, I've got this picture just because I, I like it. Of me at my school talent show <laughs> with, uh, <laughs> with the Dimebag ML Lightning guitar. Um, and that weirdly, I got into, um, I got into, hang on, let's just pop one. I, uh, I, got in, I got the guitar before I had even heard Pantera. I just thought it was a cool guitar. <laughs> it's then, not a bad uh, first guitar to have. It wasn't my first. I had a Squire, um, had like a Squire, a black Squire Strat, you know, like a very standard yeah. beginner guitar. I don't have either of those annoyingly anymore, but that, yeah. And then I got that ML, the Lightning one. I was like, I should probably check out whose guitar this is. And, uh, oh, okay. Like, That's how you got it. Yeah. And I listened to like Walk, Five Minutes Alone and a few more, you know, I mean, obviously all their music was out by then. And, uh, and, and yeah, I just, it took me a while. Like I the, the vocal, I was never there for the vocals. Um, or really anything other than the guitar at a young age, but that was—I re- just thought that was awesome. You know, I think I had the like reinventing steel album or something like that, which I think is just like, like all of the, just like a compilation of yeah. tracks. So I remember having that. I think I've still got that as well. Um, but that's in, t- in terms of a young age music in my house. I think that's—I think I've pretty much given you the whole encyclopedia, the whole, so the whole uh, discography that's in our house musically. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, Mum had a few take that CDs. I can't say I was massively uh, a few decent songs, but I can't say I was massively into them. My mum uh, was like, my mum was very much like um, take that Bon Jovi, yeah. Uh, Ug- yeah. Uh, Ugly Kid Joe, um, Van Halen, and stuff like that. But you oh, know, yeah. just weirdly, the, the yeah, Van Halen Harry. was never uh, weirdly Van Halen was never on the list. Uh, as a, I, I don't think, yeah, it was never as a kid. Weirdly, Van Halen was never really. Uh, I knew Eruption. I, that was, you know, that's sort of as when you're a kid and you hear Eruption, you're like, that's the best guitar thing I've ever heard in my life. Yeah. You know? um, and to be fair, it still is one of. But um, yeah, I, beyond that, I, I didn't get the Van Halen thing at a young age. I still like. I do like them now. I'm not. They're not a favourite, but like I do really like them. Obviously, I like a couple. Of, I like a couple of songs and whatnot. But like, I mean, to be yeah. fair, like my favourite guitar solo of all time is "Beat It." I love the solo in "Beat It." Oh yeah, that's phenomenally good. Yeah, and again, that was improvised, wasn't it? Or I at think least so. certainly not done in many takes. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was it's, on the day kind of thing. I think it's when um, it's like in that all that that middle phrase of the solo, and he just hits like this pin, uh, tapped harmonic, and it's just like oh, yeah, and... I think I know what you mean. Yeah, some of the harmonic that the, the um, there's a, there's one where he hits like a really nasty pinch, like squeal down at like yeah. the second fret or something, and it's just like vibrato and squeal, and it's just nasty. And you, I, I've never heard anyone replicate that like ever. It's that typical like brown sound um, EVH, like what was it? You know, fifty one fifty. Have you like, watched that, that typical um, sound? You know, Rick Beato on 
YouTube. I yes. don't know if you follow him. Did you watch the video where they tried yeah, to replicate the Eddie Van Halen Brown sound with using like the Variax and stuff like that? It's uh, it's quite no, an interesting. It's like, quite an interesting video. The sound, wasn't he? Yeah. It's, yeah, I, I had a. Uh... Oh, go on. I was going to say, it's quite interesting to see actually how they tried to replicate it because I think they used... Ain't talking about love as the... Okay, yeah. Um, basis of it. It's so, like, crunchy and weirdly kind of, like, brittle but not. Mm. You know, like, it, it sounds like it should be a really almost quite a weak sound, but it just isn't. It's huge, you know. Um, it's got that kind of really... Yeah, that that martially kind of like mid range that really cuts through. All the audio geeks will tell me I'm an idiot, but that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, um, but but yeah, and and uh, it's it like really cuts through, and it, you you feel like that should be losing something somewhere. You know, that's got to be surely that's not going to work as a sound, but it does. It's crazy, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of if you're gonna, you know, in terms of guitar sounds, I mean, yeah, you know what you're saying about Dimebag sound, not liking that, I think. EVH is a bit more, a bit of another one of those like Marmite guitar tones. If you don't know yeah. the, the game, you'd, it might not be for you, you know, because it's pretty, pretty distinctive and it's very much present in the mix, you know. Absolutely. Um, Where do you take your inspirations for your guitar tone? What do you like to pull elements out of? Or um, that's a good question. I think, uh, like I said, Alter Bridge are my favorite kind of. I'd say they're my favorite band. I've got a few others where they're like you know well that's sort of up there as well but um that kind of guitar tone the kind of modern like i like a modern sound i'm trying to move away from uh there seems to be this whole competition at the moment for like who's got the heaviest guitar tone um and it's just uh it's pretty evident in a lot of modern metal music and i'm not sort of criticizing it as such um but like for example a, a good example of someone that goes for heavy but has their own sound is like it's Wes Hauk in an in alluvial like it's heavy but it's got this weird like um there's something to it that you go immediately you know that's him whereas there are a lot of like heavy tones nowadays especially off the like um you know especially from like uh what's the word you know like kempers and stuff um that i, I feel like they're going heavy it's all just this competition to be like who's got the biggest sound and i think actually the way forward is probably to try and get the sound that is the most you and get the most out of that um and i'm trying to i, I want to try and figure out how to go about doing that i feel like i've got some way there i quite like the kind of i don't know how to do the, the best adjective i've come up for for the sound i like is chewy like a kind yeah. of chewy guitar tone i don't know how to i don't know what that means that might mean a lot of other things to a lot of you people you was at the uk yeah. guitar show wasn't you because i think both you yes. and me were at the one not of yeah it would have been last year wouldn't it at the start of the year what, about but, 40 years ago yeah it would have felt like 40 years ago four yeah. lockdowns ago yeah, um yeah. Did you go to Rabia's clinic on the, the Saturday when he was demoing? I only his, caught a bit board. of it. His his tone's great. I love the crack and sound. I know I, I, that's somewhere along the lines of what I might be deep going for. Because he was mind. actually saying like guitarists have this thing of where they use adjectives like chewy or like creamy or you know yeah, <laughs> for, yeah. guitar creamy's tones. Yeah, creamy's for like a nice like I'd say that's for like you know a Les Paul into like a mid gain, you know mid game kind of amp is probably what you call creamy isn't it or like that kind of smooth but got a bit of bite to it yeah that's probably a creamy tone isn't it i suppose again smooth and bite what does that even mean like you know um <laughs> to, yeah, to I, random people they're like smooth like how can you how can a guitar tone yeah. be smooth and bitey you, you just well, it's not spiky obviously that's <laughs> clear, isn't it? but yeah I, I i i don't know in terms of guitar sound i'd like to uh i think another one that i think is a really cool sound is nuno bettencourt is oh like, yeah I mean, um, it, it, though, although, I mean, that wouldn't quite fit the sound we're going for, but in terms of the idea of having a tone that, um, it's not just heavy, it's like, it's got something else going on. Whereas I think a lot of bands, I'm not going to name any, cause I, I, there's a lot of bands I really like, um, where the guitars, they sound huge and it sounds great. The audio is amazing. Um, but it like, if someone else were to play through that rig, I would probably like, yeah, you'd know who the guitarist is, but like. I, I don't know. I feel like the guitars would kind of sound pretty similar. Yeah. Um, I know they say every guitarist sounds different, you know, through the same rig or whatever, and it's true to an extent, but um, I, I don't know. You know, if you took it to this extreme, if you turned up with, you know, just like a, a Fender clean amp to a metal, you know, a metal gig, you, you know, you'd have your own sound. 
He'd get laughed off the stage. It'd sound ridiculous, yeah. But like, um, I'd like to find an, a middle ground where find an amp. I'm thinking of going for like, and this is where the money comes in. I do not have the money for it. Would be going for like more like the Bogner ecstasy kind of sound that like mm. is super high gain, but it's more like, uh, it's not that scooped sound, but it's also not um, that kind of. It's not the definitive like modern sound. You know, like Mesa Boogie, for example, was just like the. You know that was like the standard of metal sounds in like the noughties kind of thing um and sort of 90s as well and it's like there are a few more amps like that nowadays you know that um i love that i had a prs archon for a while and that was a great sound but i think i'd like to go for something a bit more I don't know, a bit more me and i don't know what that is yet so you uh, i can't actually properly answer the question yet i mean on, on, the, on the ep we used uh use camper profiles use an archon profile use an, a soldano profile and a uh one that one that uh, our producer will not tell us what it is or that or i remember he i think he told everyone in my band at when i went to the toilet and then they refused to tell me um oh that would do my head like, in. it's just a sort of grit it's like i i don't know if he's just lying and they're just bluffing but either way i don't know and that's the crux of the matter i don't know what it is um so i can't actually tell you what a third of my guitar sound is um, <laughs> it's triple track it's I interesting because I was chatting to the Ramstein producer um, cool. just before th uh, the album came out and I was talking to him about it because I was playing the Ramstein tribute when I was doing my Kemper profiles. Yes, I wanted yeah, yeah, to try, right. I wanted to try and get that sound as close as possible. And when mm -hmm. I was chatting to him and about like how the actual the album was done, and it was done for a, um, a Neve preamp and a, a, a dual rectifier, but it was on a crunch. Yeah. It wasn't on like you know a proper. Oh. And okay, I was just I like, that, a, yeah. I was like a crunch really for that heavy sound. But then like, when you think about how much they've probably layered all the yeah, different the, sounds the bass, on. Obviously. Yeah. yeah. I think and, people forget that the bass is like, you know, in terms of sculpting a guitar sound, they're like, you know, that's going to be there. <laughs> I, tr I tried using a, 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 a bass of boogie crunch one uh, for a gig and it, it, it just really did lack something. It really did yeah. lack something. And then, um, Richard had done a video in his studio in Berlin and he was talking about all the collections of amps that he's got. And um, he had a picture of uh, the Friedman 100 Deluxe. And I was like, all right, quick pause. All right, what amps, what amp settings is he using there? Like getting properly zooming in on the, on the because, fucking you know, amp. He might have just, he might have just been like screwing with the audience. He could have just put like, you know, just twisting yeah. it all around. And then he knows and, that a few people are going to look at that. And I sent, <laughs> you know? I sent the screenshot to uh, Dan at Reamp Zone because he was the one that did all my profiles and I worked with him yeah. quite closely. And um, he did it for me. He replicated the mics as best as possible. And you know what? It was spot fucking on. And I've replicated yeah. the same yeah. thing now on the quad cortex, and it's it, it's perfect, absolutely perfect. Oh, brilliant! But the yeah. more interesting thing is, is now like um, I'm now playing in um, like an original span. So of course, I need mm. my own sound. And yeah. when I was fucking about on the quad cortex, I said, let's try that amp and let's try that amp. I've gone for a combination I never would have picked in my life. Okay. So Could I'll I be able to guess or or I can have a go. I'm gonna th throw a wild card. Is there's a uh, oh, I've forgotten the name of it. There's a there's a Fender amp that can do something really heavy. I've forgotten what it's called now. Is it a supersonic? That's right. I don't something think it's like that. that. But but um that would that would have been cool. Um I think Ginger used that once, funnily enough. Um but uh okay. Wait, so it's it's a heavy tone, right? For your for your like yeah metal tone. Okay. Diesel? Nope. Okay. Am I even close? Um, you're kind of close to one of the amps because it's a stereo rig that I've gone for. Is there a Bogner in there? No. I've just gone for German. <laughs> I'm just, <laughs> just guessing other German amps. Um, no. I've gone Gander. for a JCM 900. Okay. Yeah, that's, yeah, okay. And the Soldano SLO 100. Oh, uh, okay. You mentioned the Soldano earlier, so I was like, okay, and, well, it won't be that one. Because um, I thought maybe like... <laughs> You know, greater light so speed in front of them. Oh, I used to have one of them. They're wicked, yeah. Um, and on uh, the sound is just oh, and on you know yeah. the, the stuff that we're writing is in drop B, and it just oh, it's so meaty, so so meaty. Yeah, drop drop B is an awesome tuning. Weirdly, I managed to sort of circumvent drop B with drop A and drop C 
and and you know i don't think you know somehow never goes to drop b i don't know why um I'm not a huge, yeah, I mean, I'll be honest, right. I'm not a huge fan of it. I mean, when I'm writing, my go-to is drop C. Every time is drop C. It's, yeah, I mean, it's only that, it's a semitone, isn't it? But yeah, I, I find the, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just felt at home with it. I can't remember why uh, why I picked drop C. I think what it was, was I was listening to a lot of Alter Bridge and they play in drop C sharp a lot or, yeah. or, or you know, D flat, where, I don't know. Yeah, um, they play in that a lot. And I think I probably in my head just went, Oh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to be the same. <laughs> so it's like, well, I don't want to be drop D because that's not really heavy enough. You know, or it can be, you know, I mean, take Lamb of God. But like, um, I was like, probably in my head, I was like, yeah, okay, drop C will do. And then, uh, you know, and then that's, I guess it just stuck. I don't know. Um, oh, ambulance number two. Oh, it's a fire engine. It's a nice change. Um, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's why I end up in drop C and then also playing drop A. But like, so if you take the j- drop C tuning and just drop the C down to an A, so it's like D standard uh, yeah, with low A. Yeah, because so Mastodon do that, don't they? I think a few bands, they do it. Alter Bridge do it, of course. Um, Periphery do it in that song prayer position. I imagine they do it in a few more. Um, so like, yeah, it's, it's got that weird heavy, it's sort of one of the songs we've released, one's in A. The song Carlos Bleed is in A and it's in that tuning. So it's not pure drop A. But then I've been writing some stuff in like pure drop A, like, you know, it's in drop D, but down to A. Yeah. Um, that's on the mayonnaise at the moment. So I've been writing in that as well. Um, so yeah, I, I'm I'm a big fan of that. I'd like to go into more tunings, but there's only a certain amount of guitars and like, you know, I, I mean, yeah, sure. One day if I get an endorsement or something and I can just go like whack them in all sorts of tunings, that'd be amazing. But um, there's only so many I can. And then of course, you know, Jake, the bass player, I can't just be making, you know, he needs, <laughs> he needs the same amount of basses as I have guitars or some wonder tuner, you know. Um, and, and to be fair, he does quite well sort of sorting out a tuning that works for him. Because um, we don't, we quite often aren't Matt, in our tuning you know like when he's an a i think he quite often plays an a standard um it's all yeah so um it's interesting but i I think yeah i can't maybe one day i can mess around with b and b flat and all sorts of open tunings but i don't know one day when i've got money or guitars or endorsements (laughs) or both a combination of all of them yeah so we're on the top topic let's talk insurgent because insurgent were around for like a couple of you know like a couple of years you toured around i think it was ukraine wasn't it and then you kind of you had like the band had a hiatus and now you're back with a new ep Mm. um so how come insurgent have come back around and how was it doing another ep so yeah um we kind of i think because we kind of it was around uh we found February time, uh, conveniently we, when we released our second single, um, that we just basically took some time apart. Um, we, you know, basically just a few things that we just just couldn't come to an agreement on. Basically, you know, long story short, at the time, and then COVID hit, and then we had about three months of just kind of a you know break, basically. Um, and uh, it was weirdly quite, you know, I wouldn't obviously would never wish for COVID again, but it was that particular aspect of it was quite fortunate in that we we all just had time to ourselves and we ended up kind of chatting again about three months later and it's just like and then, and then we just kind of i don't know i guess we were straight back on it and we uh we're like well we've got let's go and do this um let's do this properly get an ep done and uh we already had so we already had a couple of songs recorded so two of them will be appearing on the ep uh, one of them has already been released now um and uh yeah we had some songs ready uh a couple of like older ones that massively changed in the recording process um or not massive well yeah quite substantially um and then a couple of newer ones as well um i don't want to spoil it and say what's what just because i don't want to ruin anyone's expectations of what they might hear um but uh but yeah and then getting to do so we recorded the ep it would have been about it was last sort of october november so six eight months ago um and then we went back in in january just to finish a couple tweak a couple bits um you know january this year and uh yeah i mean the, the whole process was great like we we went in with some really killer songs and we came out with some even better songs, you know? Um, and, uh, and Tom, like Tom Gittins, our producer at Monochrome Studios, he's an absolute wizard. And uh, he, he's absolutely like going there for our first song. Again, we went in with a good song. Um, and then, but he would just say, okay, let's change this or let's like restructure this. And his, his ability to hear things like vocal harmonies, structures of songs, guitar layers, um tones things like that and then also put them together and make them the finished product it's just incredible but um yeah the recording process was awesome and and it was so exciting you know just little things like you you go from the scratch track and it's already exciting when you've got a scratch track and you're like 
oh, that's what the song's going to sound like in a bit, you know, when it's done. And then suddenly the drums are on there and you engineer the drums and you can hear that kick drum and that's just so exciting. And you can hear the thump, you know, yeah. the compression and the EQs it right. And then suddenly you can hear the thump from the kick drum and everything's just working. And then you get the bass on there and there's some like real power in there, guitar, you know, once it starts, it's just piecing it all together and you can hear this track building and building and building. Then you get the vocals on there and then you've then you've got like the the skeleton for the finished track. But we we add so much in terms of guitar layers, you know, second guitars and vocal harmonies. There are so many throughout the songs, you know, and they're not always so high in the mix. They're just there to build the, you know, because we're a one guitar band and we're obviously a one vocalist band. Um, I mean, maybe one day one of us will take up harmonies and stuff, but Katie's just such a good singer that it would almost feel like devaluing the product a bit. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we kind of, I think because of the nature of being a one guitar band, every other guitar layer gets kind of dropped a little bit because we don't want it to sound like there's someone else playing, you know, um, we don't, you know, so they're almost more sound effects than they are guitar parts, um, which is convenient because I can't remember a lot of them. <laughs> um, but, but, and they're on the backing tracks that we're going to use live now. And, and uh, I think because of that, there's a lot of bands where they have two or even three guitarists. Um, you get a bit of a competition for like who's doing what, Whereas it's very clear, I think, with our music, you've got the riff and there's uh, there's some harmony parts, you know, there's some some textural stuff, but it's all very much buried. And um, it's only when you listen to the backing tracks that you can hear all of these things in isolation. They really just bring the whole piece together. And again, Tom really contributes to that. He He's really helpful with... It's not even necessarily the part itself. It might just be, oh, what if we put something here? You know, and he might then spark an idea for me to go, oh, okay, well, how about this? Um and, and and yeah, the, the the whole process was awesome. I think, in terms of it, it really sums up our sound. These six songs, um, and like I said, the new stuff that we've been writing, it's kind of a deviates from it slightly, not massively. We're not doing like, you know, what some bands do and just going, all right, well, we've done that with that era now. We're just writing something new. You know, it's 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 a development really. Yeah, um, telling a story, so yeah. to speak. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, yeah, and funnily enough, telling in terms of telling a story, the uh, the EP is actually. Uh, lyrically is sort of like a concept ep um which um i don't want it to sound too pretentious when we say that um <laughs> but uh it's kind of like the the, the idea of uh it, i kind of don't want to ru ruin it too much i mean it'd be cool for people to take their own meanings from the songs but i, I suppose without saying too much about it it's kind of a, telling the story uh, and there is a particular order to the songs and it's not the order that they appear in the ep we put them in the ep in the order that kind of works um in terms of keeping the audience you know like uh, built musically Engaged. yeah yeah and musically telling a story through the sort of progression but um yeah there is a particular order actually that the songs in terms of the story behind them there's an order in which they appear um and uh yeah and it's kind of a, it's an interesting story about like i guess it's all told from the perspective of like a godlike figure you know of, of a um, who we call brian um as in life of brian um <laughs> And uh, and that's all. It's all from his perspective, and it's just a sort of a critique of society. And I guess you can take from what you want from the lyrics um, in terms. If of you haven't got it, he's, he's not a messiah. He's a very naughty boy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, oh, we should have sampled that somewhere. <laughs> have, you, have you heard um, uh, uh, Uzziah? Have you heard they've sampled like Frankie Boyle and stuff in this? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I have to send you that. Um, but yeah, that's uh, shout out to Noah as well, the drummer from Uzziah, because he you, I went to uni with him, and he's a crazy drummer. Um, but yeah, um, yeah, we should have sampled some Monty Python in there or something in there. But yeah, yeah, it's, uh, we, we called him Brian after Life of Brian. That was actually, it was, the lyrics were all there in terms of the ideas, that, but, but it was Tom's idea to be like, why don't you put them all together as in tell a story through the six songs with it? And it feels really profound for us. We really are attached to the story behind it. Um, so uh, yeah, we, we, we took a lot of time with the lyrics and we worked on them in the studio as well. Like, yeah, I mean, they were, we had a full set of lyrics, don't get me wrong. We didn't just appear in the studio like, oh, what are we going to sing about? Um, but uh, yeah, we're really proud of the, the lyrical ideas behind the story. And some of them really hit home for us. I say some, well, they all do, but you know, some in particular, yeah. I, there are certain lyrics I listen to and I think that really like resonates with me. Um, and I'm really happy that, that, that we got that kind of finished product that it feels like, yeah, that the music we're really happy with, but then the lyrics gives it that meaning that you, you can attach certain things to it. You know, personally, yeah. we all attach different ideas to it in the band. You know, we all have different meanings behind what, um, or different emotions attached to what, what's being delivered, um, which I think is important in music. Um, so yeah, we're, 
we're, we're just happy with the overall product. And I think um, I'm going to start sounding like a footballer with the length of this fucking <laughs> feel that I'm giving, you know, with the, yeah, great game, uh, great three points. Blah, blah, blah. I feel like yeah, it's coming out. Now, so I'll stop at that. Um, but yeah, we're really happy. We're really happy with how it sounds. And I think like, yeah, we want to move on from it without deviating too far from what we've done already. I think that's the idea anyway. Yeah. So I think um, a hard thing always for a musician is to kind of taking your material and going into it recording studio so i guess this is like a two-part question the first part being i'll make eight parts of it but go on yeah okay <laughs> that's fine uh so the first part is what did you find most challenging about being in the studio and so the second part what did you learn the most from oh okay um challenging uh i don't find too much of it like although my part my, my parts are quite technical um at least for me anyway um they I, I don't find the tracking too challenging um it's normally that the, when we get to the studio and we've got a song that we think yeah this is brilliant and then and then tom who and we value tom's opinion incredibly highly and he'll say okay i don't know if that bit's working and it's that pressure of like okay we're, you know we're paying a lot to be here and 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 you know time is a factor and you know if we need to book again he's not free for another three months you know because he's a he's a top producer and people a lot of people work with him um so um when you sat there and 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 there's this feeling in the room of okay that doesn't work you know like that that idea isn't it's not that it doesn't work it's just that it could be better um or you know okay we're we're going to add this section into a song we're going to add like a a pre-bridge or like a pre-chorus or a you know it's very rare that we'll just add a whole other thing that was never there i don't think we've ever i think there's only one song where we actually just entirely changed a part um there is actually uh, that's a lie there's one song on the ep where we restructured a lot of it and that wasn't too successful because we're in a really good headspace for that and it it felt quite creative and it was really good um and uh, actually that was the yeah, that was eclipse and we've released that already uh, and that took a lot of restructuring in the studio there were some weird time signatures in there before uh, it was in six four for a large part um so, but yeah, that the, the restructuring side of things is really tricky. Oh, it, it's gone all colours of the rainbow. Uh, uh, right, that's, I believe that's... your camera has died. Yeah, all right, let me just put that battery yeah, pack on to charge. I am still here. All colours of the rainbow, but annoyingly not in order. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> um, hashtag pride. Yeah, exactly. There <laughs> you go. Um, but yeah, so we. Uh, uh, what was I saying? We yeah. So that that the, the idea of having to on the fly come up with a part that you know you're going to be happy with when you listen back to it and when you spent loads of money on it um that's that's when the pressure kind of weighs starts to mount on a little bit when you think okay i've got to come up with something or maybe you know we're in then we're in the studio next week so i've got a week to come up with a part that is going to be on the final product and yeah. that's tricky you know that's difficult that in, in terms of yes uh, difficulties that's probably i think the hardest thing and in terms of what i've learned i think funnily enough is how to do that kind of thing you know how to how to have ideas a bit more. I, I'm very much someone that needs to plan things out, you know, and have them ready before we go. Um, being able to be a bit more spontaneous. I think hearing, I'm much better at hearing things like guitar parts, harmonies and structuring songs, um, hearing guitar layers that will fit on top, you know, like, okay, I've finished my riff, but what's going to sit underneath this or, what, or on top, however you view it, you know, um, what layers are we going to add here and there? It's, I feel like my songwriting has developed the most. My guitar playing, I think, um, I've kind of, I kind of, that's something that I developed myself, but in terms of the songs, not writing, but, uh, delivering the song, I guess, and serving the song as best as possible. You yeah. Know, having an idea and then fleshing it out in the best way you possibly can. I'm definitely better at that from working in the studio. Um, so yeah, I sort think of that, not doing the whole idea. thing of where you become this, not over, not convoluting it, but you're not overly complicating it. You, you like you say, you're serving yeah. the purpose of what's needed. Yeah, I think something that I like about our songs, and this is a bit of praising ourselves, but I think we write quite short songs. Like they're not short, but like for a metal band, metal bands quite often write five, six minute songs. We haven't got a song that's longer than I think like four, just over four minutes, like four minutes five or something. Um, but I feel like we get a lot of content in there, a lot of sections, a lot of ideas. And we, 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 we rarely sit on ideas. You know, we rarely, we're rarely on one idea for much longer than like a small section, you know? Um, and I think that's something we'd like to keep. You know, I, I love Alter Bridge and they have some like eight minute songs that are absolute masterpieces in my opinion. Um, and I feel like we've kind of just tried to take that and go, okay, we're doing it in four. 
um, we're going to try and do our best to do that. You know, mate, I'd like to delve into trying to write a bit more of a, you know, one of those six, seven, eight minute pieces that really takes you on a journey. Um, but that you've really got to have the, the most solid idea to do that. Um, and I think maybe I've had a couple of them possibly, but we'll see. So it's, it's different holding the audience's concentration for four minutes to do it over seven or eight minutes. You've really got to, yeah like say tell a full picture because if you had the same thing going on for eight minutes people's gonna go okay next yeah and it's either like the idea is either you've got to have you know if you're going to say stretch out a verse or a chorus or like whack in three guitar solos you, i think you need a fan base basically a substantial fan base to do that because like i don't think anyone unless you're a real music fan that's committed to learning hearing new stuff you're not going to sit there for eight minutes you know you might sit there for two but um yeah so at least if you sit there for two minutes you've listened to half of the song <laughs> with us rather than a quarter yeah um so yeah maybe one day i'd like to delve into exploring ideas in more depth you know really fleshing them out um but for now i think what we've got really works and we're really happy with it it'd be nice because we can just make our set a bit longer as well <laughs> you know, um <laughs> yeah we've got three, you know. we've got 40 minutes and we're going to get three songs in in that 40 minutes <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah our songs used to be a lot longer as well until we went to the studio and it's like right cut 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 <laughs> Okay, there's a minute off. All right, it's fine. Um, keeps it punchy, keeps keeps it interesting. So um, that's another thing that I got out of the studio, to be fair. Just delivering your message concisely, you know, whether that's through music or lyrics or whatever. Um, you've got you've to do that, I think, just to grab people's attention. And then the people that are already fans, if you can have that immediate delivery of the sort of emotional message of the song, I think that's important as well. Like we, we quite quickly will get to the main bit of the song like oh that's what the song's about and we're quite often there within 30 seconds you know um yeah. so uh that's something i think we kind of aim for um again i don't know how, how i don't know what even what the first question was but there we go <laughs> we got there in the end yeah we got <laughs> somewhere in the end don't know where there is we got, there. <laughs> we, we got to a point so yeah. like obviously insurgent you know they're still a relatively you know a small band but they're getting good praise you mm -hmm. signed up with a label now but Obviously, a lot of people in the music scene, you think of, oh, I'm going to make my own band and I'm going to have big crowds and, you know, but sometimes the harsh reality is sometimes you might be performing to three people in the downstairs yeah. club. Like, perform to three? Jeez, that's, that's good. <laughs> like, you know, in a really sick expectation, how have you actually found yeah. that yourself? What, performing to sort of small groups of people? In there? Yes. Yeah, it's... um. It's 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 a weird one because sometimes uh, like so we played uh, oh just to clear up so the um, the the signing that's to a uh, distributor um, which is it's not quite a record label um, I, I know people got really excited because we had, we said signed it's like we're not on a record label but <laughs> but it's you know it's going the right the right way to be fair but um, and to be and blah blah so distribution that we're with it, they've they've already got us on like you know like the breaking metal playlist on Apple and stuff like that which is awesome so hopefully that'll bring us some some plays um but um but yeah in terms of playing to like this uh, the more intimate crowds should we call it it's a bit like when calling calling something cheap calling it affordable you know the intimate yeah. crowds in other words three people um yeah it's it's uh it it, dep it depends who's watching to be fair but like we've played gigs we played at the gifford arms uh quite a while ago and um it wasn't the biggest crowd but we got such a good like i feel like almost everyone came up to us and said oh i loved your music it was great um you know, like in Ukraine, there are a couple of gigs that are a bit quiet, you know, like a couple that were awesome. Like they were all good to be fair, but um, yeah, there are a couple that we kind of turned up and we're like, oh, I don't know what to make of this. Like, is this going to be any good? Like we'll play like, you know, obviously. Yeah. Um, and, but then, yeah, like there's one gig we played. It was this tiny little pub in a town called Kremenchug or Kremenchuk. I can't remember how you say it. Um, and we turned up and it was just totally empty basically when we turned up and it was this little pub and and we were just thinking, and we, oh yeah, we had an 11 hour drive to get there on the worst road I've ever been on in my life. Genuinely, the speed bumps were like half the size of the van. And um, <laughs> and we got there and it was like, we walked in, it's like, there was like the guy behind the bar and I think there were like a couple of people there. It's like, geez, is this really like... Is it like that meme where there's like, like, like there are three people going, there's like a little mat in the corner going, that's the stage. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, but pretty much. But it was it was a cool. I'm not trying to uh, put the venue down. It was a really cool place. It's just we we had expectations going in there and thought, oh, this isn't going to be great. We're all knackered from such a long drive, and then uh, yeah, and it was it was a massive crowd. There was probably only 
I don't even know how many people were there, but not loads. But it was really everyone came up and like spoke to us, got photos, um, you know, like spent time with us and really enjoyed what we were doing. And that was great. Like, I, and I think, you know, when you get the bigger, when you start playing to thousands of people, you don't get that. Like mm. you still obviously you get the massive or or inspiring thousands of people singing to you, which is another thing. But um, yeah, playing to I, I, I do enjoy it. And we've had a few bigger gigs where we've played to, you know, like larger maybe you know a good few hundred people and and that feels great um because that feels good because even if they're not massively into it you're like well at least there's a good number of people there you yeah know? um but yeah there have been a few gigs so we've played to not that many people but then they've come up afterwards and said that was awesome i, I loved your set you know um and that kind of makes it worth it even if it's just a small group and you find those are the ones that keep following you and then they turn up to the next gig and they also turn up with that other one person that was at that gig yeah suddenly you got two people at your gig you know um and it seems to be going that way as well on like jumping to sort of social media. Like we, you know, we got a, a really good response sort of in our uh, sort of locally from, from our music, you know, I just see people sharing it and it's, um, and then their friend would share it or whatever. And it's, it's gone really well on that front. So I'm hoping the next release will get that and some, you know, like, and, and then some, because it's um, hopefully people are excited now and, you know, we've got another song coming out at some point soon. Um, so I, I will, we'll we'll talk about that you know we'll, as a band we'll, we'll release that soon but uh we'll sort of give details of it but but yeah playing to playing to small small sort of venues and that is, is great and i feel like i'm it's weird um playing at the birmingham are so many great little venues and like going to all of them i feel like it, it almost feels like like in the video games where you complete levels you know? <laughs> it almost feels like i'm completing birmingham you know i've played so many of the little like well the good thing is venues, the flappers you know, back little, open now or it yeah. is opening so i'm sure we'll see you back there Oh, he's froze. I'm going to have to try and keep the it's, audience. Um, sorry, uh, internet, sir. It's there we go. He's back. He's back. Or at least somewhat. Note to self, insert a meme or a video of uh, technical difficulties or please wait while we resume your regular whatever. Hey, was that, I think that was, was that me or you? I think that was you. Oh, was it? You, I, look, I literally just walked out to look at my internet and it was actually okay for once. You, were, just, you were just um, kind of go, froze. Go um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, for, for me, you froze on. The good thing is, I was like, is what? Oh, <laughs> uh, uh, the um, good thing is the but, flap yeah, is sorry, back uh, open. Well, you can cut that bit or whatever. Um, Yes, I did. I, I caught that as well about 10 seconds later. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, no, that's awesome. We played there a couple of times and I'm sure we'd, we'd love to play there again. That was, I love that venue. Um, it's just such a cool place and it's just the right kind of vibe for new metal bands, you know. Well, not not NU metal bands, but also <laughs> that, you know. Um, speaking of Limp Biscuit, a touring with Spirit Box, and I'd quite like to go and see that. Yes, that's I saw one. that. I'm, I'm down for that. Yeah, Limp, I've seen Limp Biscuit before. They were awesome. I love I'm... how people kind of met. People just sort of shit on them, but. Nah, I enjoy Limp Biscuit. It's good fun. I, I enjoy him as well. I mean, I was having that the riff, the chat right? with um, Paul, who I don't know if you've seen the episode with Paul, but obviously he plays in a Biscuit tribute band, or did rather. And we were talking about that. How, but we were saying the new metal scene probably wouldn't have existed without like Limp Biscuit because they kind of really kick started it. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, early Slipknot, Limp Biscuit, Corn, Snot. All of them. <laughs> I don't actually know them. Snot were pretty much the first new metal band, and Corey Taylor has referenced them quite a lot as being a big influence for Slipknot. Oh, oh, Mudvayne as well being another one. They, yes, uh, another another big new metal. Yeah, yeah, I, I do like some new metal. I think our, our stuff goes a bit uh, down a diff, bit of a different route. Like the, it's a bit more technical. You know, some of the new metal stuff is very much just in your face riffs, whereas I think ours are a little more. Um, I d it makes it sound like I'm trying to sound better than that, which I'm not saying we are. <laughs> it's just like they're a little more complex or a bit more intricate in some ways, but that's not obviously that's not always better. It's just how we deliver our music, you know. But it's definitely new metal inspiration in places, or at least it's there in our hearts, you know. Um, yeah. Even if it's not audible as such, um, certainly certainly like some of it. 
in terms of your writing style, because like you say, obviously there's the there's the Tremonti um aspect to it. There's also the very progressive side to it as well with the time signatures and stuff like that. How do you sit down and approach your writing, your material? Do you hear an idea and go, oh, should I do a play on that? Or do you is it literally just noodling uh, and it's spend most of the day hating yourself as a musician and then and then eventually something comes out yeah that's <laughs> me no, not, yeah. <laughs> hands up yeah no 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 um it's joking aside i am very self-critical and i don't mean that in the sense that critical as in hard on myself although you know, i feel like every musician is it's more that i very little gets through the filter i find when i'm writing um i feel like i probably if i wanted to be less selected could have written 30 or 40 all right songs by now um but very little gets through the that kind of filter and i think that you know without tooting my own horn i think that's what means what makes me write good songs you know um I, you know everyone's got to like their own music and I, I i think part of what makes the stuff that i write good is that i don't really let a lot of it through so unfortunately it means i don't write as many songs as some people but um but in terms of the process it's like uh for me it's normally it, i feel like uh, I, I like john May john mayer has a bit of an analogy where it's just like yeah sometimes music it just comes out of nowhere like you're just playing and you ha have this idea and i've had that um like there are a few riffs on the on the uh on the ep where they've they've come out in like half an hour you know uh, or at least like the main idea it's changed but the main ideas are in half an hour um whereas john may he says that you know sometimes music feels like math homework and you've got to figure it out. You've got to actually get to that finished product. And I think there are too many musicians nowadays or that have this expectation that like all of these amazing songs just came out of nowhere and they might have done, but I feel like you've got to have a bit of resilience and you've got to, if you can hear a good idea, you've got to be able to pursue it. And even if you're sat there for a few hours thinking like, where is this going? A few hours ago, you knew there was something there. And I, I always try and pursue those ideas. And I think there's, I've had a few good riffs out of that where, you know you just you're writing something and you hear this little melody or this little like rhythm that just really gets you but you don't know what it is that works yeah. or you know how to really get it to work and i feel like i pursue them as much as i can um, a lot of people will go will spend a few hours on that and they'll either stick with what they've already got and that's the song or they kind of won't pursue it further and they'll just drop it um and i'm always reluctant to drop ideas like so what i've started doing now is i um, and I don't do it as much as I should. What I have started doing is I've organized all my songs into one, one to five star, like one being like, like if it's, if it's truly just not usable, I just won't save it. But I, I like to think most things are at least a one out of five, you know? Um, and, uh, what I do is I put it in there and uh, you know, I'll, I'll try and every, anytime I write something, I get, I get filed. And the temptation is always to work on the fours and the fives out of five, you know, like, oh, well, these are definitely going to be songs, but it's like, actually if there's something that's all out of five right there's probably still a tiny little idea there's something there that i like it doesn't it might not be massive but it might just be like even two chords next to each other or like a rhythm that just does something or even if it's just really simple it's like, okay how do we make that a two out of five you know how do i make that just that bit better and yeah. then okay now it's a two out of five well it might be a little easier to make this a bit better now because i'm not like, fighting against the tide the whole time um i've had a few ideas that have worked their way up the ladder like that and um, there's one now that it's definitely going to be a song it's one of the ones in drop a on the uh, the mayonnaise over there um that, uh, sponsored by Heinz like that you know I had a bit of an idea it's... Yeah, yeah yeah exactly no nah, Hellman's Hellman's mayonnaise <laughs> um but yes either way um yeah so that's kind of how I, like, I started working my writing and I'm going to start doing the, the whole twitch thing and I was thinking what I want to do is just start writing on because it's really going to force me to do it as well if I just sit down like right, okay I'm doing a three or four hour stream I'm just going to write music in that whole time it's like even if there's no one there at least I'm on camera it's like I got to do something you know I can't just it's just that bit of a push to like okay you got to do it so I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing I think and streaming at the same time because it's like I might as well get something out of my time as well you know immediate some immediate practical you know use out of my time while I'm i tried writing. doing that on twitch last year and it fell flat on its ass so it's just like uh i remember I think just mine doing... probably will but <laughs> i remember trying to, uh i was doing like three a week i set out a full schedule i was putting the schedule out and no one ever kept joining i was like oh, this is just a waste of time <laughs> did you ever get any did anyone join or like or, or is it just like or you get the occasional few or it was like if somebody coming, it was literally for all for like three seconds and then they'd be out again. And yeah. It's just like, oh, 
I'm fully expecting that to be honest. I mean, I'm going to try. I am going to give it a good go, but like, yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. I just, I'd like to get something out of my time. I think if I'm going to be there anyway, I might as well, you know, and maybe if the van gets somewhere, then yeah, I might be able to drive some traffic that way. And, and then, you know, by default, when I turn to John, there'll be like at least like four people there and that's enough. You know, it's enough for me to want to do it. Truth be told, working in the NHS, you just don't have the fucking time to do anything anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, that's I. I don't blame you. I don't blame, you, especially the, the way the world is now. I don't blame you at all. Um, but yeah, I think my. I mean, with the guitar teaching, it's like I've got the time. You know, I, I teach in the evenings mainly, and then I do like an all day on Sunday. Um, so I've got the time if I want to set it aside. You know, that's that's it's it's there. So I'm going to try and make use of my time. Um, and hopefully, yeah, again, if the band starts to pick up a little bit, and I'm hoping it will off the CP. You know, we've got a press campaign behind it. We've put some. You know, we've got we're doing some of our own advertising um sort of social media and that which is not done it's done okay so far but like we're still we're finally sort of figuring out the advertising getting it to actually be as effective as it can it's all the algorithms yeah, isn't it oh god I, why, why can't they just forget they just abandon all the algorithms and just everything just got randomly whacked out there like it would all by default if everything just randomly appeared in front of you you'd see about an equal amount of all the things you follow and i just yeah. think like can we not just do that <laughs> you know Forget so many people now. now on my Instagram that like I'm friends with, but they're like stories and that are like, you know, 300 behind other people. Oh yeah. And, and it's just like this stuff, the actually that you want to see, it's just, you're not getting to see yeah. annoyingly. Well, it's little things like, um, Gajira announced a tour, I think today or yesterday. Yes. Um, and I'm definitely going to go to that. And, but I didn't even see it come up. It was like I had to scroll quite far, or like one of my friends tagged me in or something. Like, why did yeah, you I only, I only saw it. My thing? I only saw it because one of my friends had shared it on Facebook, and I was like, "How have I not seen that?" Yeah, and yeah, and I, I there's another. Yeah, sometimes even our own band stuff, which I always like, I always share, I always I comment on it quite regularly, just to keep the engagement up. Sometimes that doesn't even appear. Like I'll post it a band, go onto my personal account, and it's not and it's even not there. at the top of the thing. Like what? This is like the main thing I do on my Instagram and it's not <laughs> how much do I have to pay to see my own shit? Like, you know, this is stupid. That's how they um, get you. So yeah, hopefully if we can get, you know, keep building. Yeah. Well, if we can keep building the following, then hopefully we won't have to drive that so much, you know, mm. but it's going the right way. You know, we've had a few good, good few extra followers since the, the songs came out. So it's going the right way. I'm sure that there'll be some uh, listeners and watchers here that will see your performance at the, end of the, at the end of the podcast and they're going to go and, follow it and check it out i'm sure yeah yeah hopefully i i, I hope so <laughs> or they'll just they'll hear me talk for five minutes and go, okay i'm gonna skip to that performance <laughs> then, you know, so you might see you might see your your, your views go like that uh, 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 and then you know i don't know <laughs> you're missing the point we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah exactly you should miss it all in that bit yeah if that it does happen don't tell me i don't want to know <laughs> <laughs> So the main part of obviously guitar geeks is talking about guitar gear. So would you class yourself as a guitar geek and a gear nerd? Uh, yeah. uh, sort of. I'm. I'm a. I really like my guitars. I'm not so big on the like uh, the amps and the kind of. I don't like getting washed away with all the technicalities of pedals and amps and profiles and all of that stuff. Um, if someone could just say to me, this is your, this is the sound that's going to, you know, say there was just some, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? The, the guy who gives out all the wands in Harry Potter and he, and oh, he, knows, he just, yes. And he just, he knows what they need. He's like, okay, you need this one. Or he tries that one and then something blows up over there. Like, nah, I need, I need that guy to give me that. <laughs> you know? I just, and then I'll be happy and maybe a few pedals, you know? Um, I don't want to have to think about it too much. Guitars I am interested in. I'm interested in like what pickups I might want or, you know, being able to change my sound a bit on that front and the feel, like I'm really interested in like the, the feel of the guitar, you know, I can't just play any guitar. And like, I've got this, um, this is my absolute like um, baby is my, my PRS, this one uh, here. Um, got Mark Tremonti's signature upside down on the top there. Oh, well, I suppose it's the right way up now because I'm holding it upside down, but <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a bit like beaten up um, partly from me and partly because I bought it secondhand and it was a bit cheap because it was like a bit damaged. And I think PRS owners li like their uh, high quality goods and it, because it was a bit scuffed, it was a, probably a, probably a two out of five on the, uh, on the cosmetic side. Um, and it probably is <laughs> closer to a one now. Um, although it's still shiny. I've never played a PRS. I've never played well, one. This, this guitar, I, I, um, 
so for perspective we so i recorded with this in the studio and they were using mayonnaise a little bit for some layers and <laughs> actually no we barely use mayonnaise we did use this and uh the tom the producer said if he could steal any instrument from any uh sort of musician that he's worked with it would be this this guitar um and it's it's the best thing i've ever played still i think it's because i did, i developed so much as a musician with this that it's just home for me you know um like i just i know what to expect from it i know and then when i go on to other instruments i'm kind of like a bit lost sometimes and there are a select few that i've played where i think okay i could i could gel with this if i if it were mine forever you know um i really like the feel of strandbergs i just don't like how they look um if they made like a more standard looking guitar like something more like this you know more the yeah. two horns and the or, or even if they just didn't cut away the back of it or the uh because they've got like the double cutaway on the underside haven't they yeah um if they just got rid of one of them I could be tempted. I don't mind. I'd like a headstock. I'm not bothered. I don't think they need. I, actually, no, I do like headstocks. I think they're a cool artist. I'm a headstock snob. I am. I'm a proper yeah, headstock snob. Yeah, I think PRS snob. headstocks are wicked. Um, I like them. Although that said, I don't really like the. I don't like the logo because it's just his signature, isn't it? Yeah. And I, I feel like they could. I don't know. It looks a bit scribbly to me. Sorry. Paul. I can't. I like that, but I don't like you know when they have to start the S E in like the big block letters. I find that as a yeah. Pop. Then they've got S E in a big block, and you're like, well, what? You know, you've got this ornate little signature followed by you know C on the end of it, and it's like, well, why didn't you just you know? Could you not have scribbled that nicely? I don't know. But um, but yeah, I've got this. Um, I really um, want. If I was gonna buy a PRS, I would love a Silver Sky. I really would. They're they're awesome guitars, yeah. They they play. Um, I remember uh, they kind of toured it. They did like a um, hang on. Yeah, they did like a little tour of the Silver Sky, and there's only like a few that had been made, and they took it round like guitar guitar shops. I think I remember trying it in guitar guitar Epsom, and uh, I do remember picking up weirdly through an MT15 because they were kind of the, the two came out at the same time. It's a weird pairing, but um, I remember playing it thinking, and I wasn't really that capable at the, uh, especially the cleanest stuff in the guitar at that time but i do remember picking it up thinking this is pretty phenomenally good and for the price point as well like it's not cheap but it's not it's certainly cheaper than some top class strats you know and but it's up there with them in terms of playability and tone and everything so i think with prs really a lot of the price tag with prs is you're paying for the looks but i think with the silver sky yes. you're paying for how it plays yeah, I think PRS, I don't think you can ever go wrong on playability. Like I've got an SE, I have got an SE, um, that, that was my first PRS. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't think you can go wrong on playability. Like they're just so solid. Um, the, the Yeah, like the, the, my SE, the frets have gone quite far down because I just played it so much as I was sort of, I mean, they're starting to, I'm really scared because they're starting to go on my custom. And, uh, mm. and it's such a perfect guitar that eventually I'm going to have to refret it or like grind them or something. And I'm just a bit nervous that it's not going to be the same afterwards, you know. And then it's just this beaten up PRS. Like, well, like, I can't sell it. <laughs> no one's going to buy that. Well, they will, but not for very much money. Um, but no, I, I will never be getting rid of that. That will be, that will stay with me. I think all my guitars now, be. I could not sell any of my guitars now. I genuinely oh, yeah, I mean, if, attached to all mine. Oh, yeah. If there was a fire in my house, it would be like, you know, guitar, parents, cat. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, like maybe in that order maybe honestly in that <laughs> no, maybe, probably not um but yeah th those are things <laughs> that, that's all i'd get out of the house if i had to um and uh yeah uh, maybe a mac just because it's got all my ideas on it but um but yeah I, I the other thing is i can't do uh speaking of silver sky I, I know you're a fan of them but i i can't do signature guitars i just can't for me once it's got someone else's name on it it's a bit spoiled I, four out of, four out of five of mine signatures. I know, yeah, I know. It's just weird. I guess it's just a di difference. Of well, opinion, but I, I just can't do it. I, I, to me, uh, the guitar has to be unique to you. And I just, I get, I mean, I know there are some, like, technically, yeah, people are like, oh, well, a Les Paul's a signature or a Gem's a signature. Like, yes, but not really, is it's it? It's weird like, because anymore. I've never in, like, it's weird because, like, I'm, I look at them now and I think, I, it's all that I have never. Well, the only one that I've gone to seek out was the Arza K's because yeah. how they look yeah. and how they play. Yeah. But like the the Chapman's just happened, but the the guitar that I pick up to write on that I, you know, when I get in from work or mm -hmm. I'm testing something out, it's always that ML one. It's the cheapest guitar I've got. Oh yeah, they're great. Yeah, the yeah. ML one beer is just like. 
the neck has gone completely gloss now because of how much I play it. Yeah. Yeah. The frets are starting to go down on it. That you can see polish, like where my arm sits on it. Yeah. And it's the cheapest guitar I've got. I've got a three grand custom shop ESP. You know, I've yeah. got an American made Les Paul, but it's still the made in Korea ML1 that feels uh, like home. Yeah, I, I, to me, I think, um, uh, it, yeah, for me, the, uh, and actually, one thing I definitely need to point out. So, my, uh, uh I've got, uh, so I've got two PRSs. I've got a Fender Strat, which is my uh, sort of dad's. My dad sort of basically lets me use that, um, and I teach with that quite often. Um, I've got my mayonnaise. Got my dad's old acoustic, but I've also so um, I ordered. I won't. I won't say who it is, but I ordered a custom guitar a while ago. You'll know. You'll know. You'll, yeah, you know, um, which was just a nightmare, and um, it didn't. It just didn't go to plan at all. Like it just took a long time, and uh, a lot of things weren't delivered on. Um, I imagine the guy on the other end would probably have other things to say about the matter but either way basically i ordered custom guitar and waited a long time and it never it, it is not here <laughs> the yes. money was returned but it is not here um so but my dad went about building a guitar for me and of course you're probably thinking huh how did that go um but um it, it was all he did it all like by the book and i learned he's a very like kind of craft like arty sort of um just very good at building things and and, uh, and and art, you know, he did the artwork for our EP, for example. Um, so he's got a good combination of, you know, artistic vision and sort of, uh, practical building, you know, construction kind of skills. Um, and he built built this. Um, and this is the you know, first ever guitar he's built. Um, and obviously, you know, everyone listening can't see it, but managed to build that, uh, you know, oh, Jesus, I just whacked my mic. Sorry, Dad. That's a guitar. Um, but uh, but yeah, he's managed to do that from from scratch. He's got like bare knuckle hardware, shallow shallow hardware, um, like all the same um, uh, woods that were in the custom build. Um, and yeah, and I, I play that quite often. I play it at home. I'm always I'm pretty terrified to take it anywhere because if I break it, I don't think I could forgive. And does it actually play? Um, it plays phenomenally well. Yeah, the um, it's got a really chunky neck on it. Um, which I think he's going to build, and he's he's doing another one uh, in the very near future. Um, and I probably have a slightly thinner neck, but in terms of playability, it's great. Like the um, the action's great. Um, it's set up really well. It's really resonant. It's got quite a unique tone to it. Um, it's quite so. I've got a nail bomb in that, and I've also got a nail bomb in the mayonnaise, and they do sound quite different. Um, mm. like yeah, different two, two of my guitars have got uh, EMG fifty seven sixty six sets in. Yeah. And the ones in the Chapman are really chunky. Like there's it there's just something about that pickup in that guitar that yeah. whenever I just hit that open like open C, I'm just like, oh, you know, oh. What? I, I uh, and then I do I, it in the I said Kate, and it's really bright. It's so weird, um, but they're the same woods. They're both older bodies, mahogany necks. Interesting. I. uh you know what and I, I i don't know i don't know what it is but i've played a few chapmans and they ju they're just not for me i i do like the the beer i've played the beer a few times i've i've only played the pro one i imagine the, the standard line one is probably pretty similar but um i, I do like that but there's something i don't know the, the guitars don't um i don't i know a lot of people that you ask them about any brand of guitar they'll just be like oh it's great and i don't want to be that guy like I, I i i of course i think they're great instruments but i just there's something about them i just never quite gelled with i couldn't even tell you what it is i think it's just the feel of it i don't know that it didn't sound quite right to me um not that that's obviously loads of guys have got great sounds out of them it's just not like one being the beer um but yeah there's something about i don't know the guitars just didn't quite hit home for me i don't know what it was um i like the beer that one i did enjoy i try i think i tried the ghost fret one i think i tried an ml1 as well um and I don't know. You know this. I didn't like. I tried a ghost like, fret, and I didn't like the ghost fret. I found it was too top heavy. It, it, the balance wasn't quite right on it. Yeah, I don't remember what it was. I just remember not. Yeah, there's something about it, and there's no by no means like I, I love what Rob Chap. I, I think Rob Chapman's amazing, and I think what they do as a company is awesome. I like how they're quite socially uh, sort of like that. They're quite well integrated with their audience, and they they have votes and stuff, and they. I think they're an awesome company. Um, I did I fanboy a little bit when they started to follow me. I did fanboy a little bit. I'm not going to cool. lie. Yeah, I would. I would a bit. Um, <laughs> yeah, like I'm trying to think. I, I fanboyed a bit when. Uh, so at, at Download Fest, I I met a few of the guys from Bleed from Within, and I I uh, yeah. to Scott Kennedy, the singer, 
Um, and I said, oh, it'd be cool to send some music your way, you know, not really expecting him to actually check him out. He's a really, he's a really nice guy. Like there wasn't any reason for me to not expect it other than, you know, he's a popular guy and he probably gets people sending him music all the time. Um, but he checked it out and he follows us on Instagram and he shared our stuff and he, he really likes it. So that was a bit of a, like a fanboy moment. I thought, oh, that's cool. Cause I really like Blue Pond then. I think they were awesome. Yeah. Um, so he, and he follows us and checks our stuff out, which is really cool. So. It's not a bad, uh, it's not a bad uh, number to have in your address book or whatever. <laughs> no, exactly. And I've chatted to him a little bit. He's, he was really, he was, so, he was such a nice guy when I chatted to him. Um, and he was, yeah, he was genuinely interested in what we're doing. Like I've, I felt like even if he didn't really like the music, he probably wouldn't have followed us and shared it, but he certainly would have been supportive, I think. Yeah. Um, maybe not, <laughs> but it, it, I, I got that impression off him. I felt like he was genuinely interested in what I was doing. I was saying to him, you know, like I, he was off on the main stage of downloads. Like I want to be there one day, you know, I was saying that to him. And, that me all. <laughs> yeah, oh god, yeah. I think even if you don't play an instrument, you'd love to do that. But um but yeah, I think uh that uh, yeah, he, he had a very genuine approach to him. I'd like to think if we get anywhere, I'd like to carry that with my with me as well. Um, you know, have that kind of still be a normal person. I don't know, it depends how far we go, I guess. But when I've played festivals, even as part of a tribute band, it's so fucking terrifying. It really is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just yeah, see, goes wrong, it's sea of people. Of people, and it's just yeah. like fuck. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine supporting Ramstein as a Ramstein tribute? That'd be interesting. Well, we we were meant to be playing um, in Cardiff and Coventry the nights before the main gigs, but obviously COVID oh. was just like, no, nah, that ain't happening. Oh, that's so annoying. Oh, that yeah. would have been good. Yeah, because um, one of my mates, Ad, you know, what from Death Blooms, and yeah. that, and. Um, he was saying obviously about when they were playing in um manchester and then fieldy and all that turned up yes, and yeah, Ray Lewis, awesome. yeah yeah because yeah. he he just happened to just tweet them on every single like social media platform and oh, then they so turned they up out, yeah. and Ad, when ad was on the podcast and he said he just turned around like that and all of a sudden <laughs> fieldy was standing behind him and he was just like <gasps> yeah, that's cool. i love uh, uh, ray the drummer i think he's awesome he's so underrated he's so he's underrated so, he's just so groovy like he's not he's not the, the speed guy he's not like the i mean i guess it's by nature of the band like they're not one of those bands with the flying double kicks and the crazy yeah kicks and that but um he's got so much groove he's awesome i think um he's for me i, I just really enjoy him watching him live he's so like charismatic and energetic I seen Korn live i've just seen videos of him like drum cams and stuff i saw them at download and they were fantastic at download oh, i'd love to catch him corn and gajira are two big ones i really need to see live i haven't yet i've missed gajira like five times as in had tickets and not annoyingly the one that always gets away from me is devon towns and and black peaks uh, never oh. i've seen black peaks a couple of times they're good they're awesome the last like uh the first time i had tickets um i ended up being on call and I couldn't go because I got called out. Oh, no. uh, the second time is when we all had to have his um, surgery, so they postponed it. And then the third time, mm. um, it got cancelled because of COVID. I was just like, I just, I just want to see them. <laughs> they are really, they're awesome. They're such a cool band. Yeah, I, I, I um, that'd be an awesome band. I'd love it if we could maybe one day like tour with them or something. They're, they're cool. I mean, it's a different kind of feel. I don't know. A different sort of sound but i feel like there's some crossover in the music and if we could somehow get on a tour with them that'd be awesome because hopefully really um ones. joe is going to be on the podcast soon i'm waiting for him to get back to me but i'm hoping to have oh, well, one here tell, let, let him know that insurgent would love to go on tour with them I'll, I'll nip it in the bud for you yeah nip it in the bud isn't that killer is that isn't that just well you know what i'll i'll i meant to say like i'll slip it i know into what you mean you'll, you'll, you'll uh yeah Throw in, throw in other phrase, yeah. Yeah, I won't yeah, kill yeah. it for you. That's harsh. <laughs> yeah, that just kill my dreams live on air. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that's not, that's not what I mean. Um, yeah, no, no. When you was at download, I saw yes. a clip um, during the Skin Dread set where there was someone crowd surfing as Jesus. Did you see that? Yes, that was awesome. <laughs> that but looked wicked. The thing, I, the thing I have to point out was I was at download in 2017, and I was in a Slayer pit. Um, and I, I i was with a friend and it was quite scary because it's just like it was just, that, it was just, just loads of coked up old men basically that was kiss wasn't it <laughs> was it kiss uh, the headline that year? i don't no i don't think it was that year um i oh, know that year way, might have been event sevenfold and it was it was yeah um and i was in the i was in the slayer pit and uh i fell over and then like my mate fell on me and then i and then i got up and then like 
he fell over and I kind of end up like tumbling around. We got up. I remember like I was a bit sort of dazed. I remember seeing someone in a Shrek mask with an inflatable chainsaw walking around. I was like, now nah, this is enough. I'm getting out of here. And then <laughs> this year, and then this year, the first person I see in the first mosh pit was Shrek man with his inflatable chainsaw chainsaw in a mankini i'm like jesus christ how are you still here like you know <laughs> four years on plus a pandemic and you're still here doing the same thing <laughs> yeah i mean kudos and then i saw i saw him on someone's shoulders in a mankini like that's whoever that's shoulders you going are, that's some, that's a bold choice um, <laughs> yeah i, I, I was, love festivals for that because you just oh, they're see amazing, so yeah. much random shit it's untrue I, <laughs> There was a guy. There was a guy in an inflatable like T Rex outfit. Yes, and he he was in a dinghy, wasn't he? Yeah, but then also he was walking around when there was no music on. He was just walking around, and someone's playing the Jurassic Park theme tune (laughs) behind him, (laughs) which just like really out of tune. It was so funny. I was just queuing for the toilet, and I was really hungover. Just remember looking like, is this even happening? (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> I love festivals and stuff like that because oh, I miss you them just so much. see oh, yeah, so downloaders. much. Yeah, the only time I've ever been slightly com- not confused, but like you know when you feel really out of place at a gig. Yeah. And um, I bought my girlfriend tickets to go and see Lady Gaga because she'd really okay. wanted to go and see it. And to be fair, Lady I quite Gaga like. a bit metal, isn't she? She likes a. Uh... Like I like I like her anyway, but then like when we were outside queuing to go in, and there was just I was I just felt so out of place because I must have been the only straight guy there. <laughs> like there's people in like drag outfits and like trans yeah. and whatnot, and I was just looking around like I'm so out of place right now. This is insane. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think I can't. I don't think I've honestly ever. I couldn't even name you a gig that I've been to that isn't like a rock gig. I mean, well, I know that's a lot. I've been to like some like small local gigs, but in terms of big gigs, you know, yeah, I don't think I've ever been to a big gig that isn't like a rock or a metal band. I've been to you know like local like mates. I've seen friends who are like in I don't know little yeah. bands or jazz bands or acoustic acts and stuff, but I've never been to a big, not that I can name. So that goes to show how much I pigeonholed my own listening. Um, I'm I'm genuinely I like quite it. open. I will if I like it, I will go and see it. You know, I don't have yeah yeah an issue that but in all fairness when i saw gaga that was probably one of the best gigs i've seen to one for production production was incredible oh well that would have been through the roof yeah yeah uh and two like she was pitch perfect man like yeah. absolutely pitch perfect i wonder if she got any help on that i don't think so i think that was all yeah. legit i mean i'm not i'm not yeah i'm not sort of trying to sort of uh rain on her parade but i do wonder if especially some of these big pop stars can they afford to be caught out off pitch on these gigs when there are like fifteen thousand people watching them i think sometimes you can genuinely tell when stuff is like back in track like when i saw ramstein the download in 2016 there, um there when i saw ramstein did that a download in 2016 um schneider dropped um a drumstick or or something and then the whole band went out of sync because you could hear Till going bang, bang. And then all of a sudden the lights were going bang, bang. And you could hear the back into it. And it completely oh, threw it yeah. out of sync. And you could really tell when it had oh, fucked man. up. And it was very yeah. awkward to say the least. It's, it's funny. Although I said I've never been to a, uh, a gig that isn't a rock or metal gig, like a big one. I, uh, when I was a student, I went to see, uh, well, I say I went to see, I went to a club night and S Club were there. Um, but it was advertised as S Club, and you think like S Club Seven, but it was S Club Two. There were two of them, and I cannot remember what it was—the blonde one, uh, and then one of the guys. And um, I can't remember, but it was—I felt like I just been sold down the river because I, I saw like th- I heard like they they played like three songs, and it was like two in the morning at some crappy club in Birmingham. <laughs> That's the only pop gig I think I've ever been to, and it was terrible. Um, and I, I think like, I guess a lot of students something. made like, you know, it counts for something. I mean, I you know, um, I, I just remember being there like, this is S Club Two, this is a lie, you know. And I wasn't really drunk enough to enjoy it. So my mum won tickets on the right. Re- I was must have been. I don't think how old I would have been. I would have been about six or seven. Uh, my mum won tickets to see Blue in concert, and she that and she had to took me with her. 
and you know that was that was kind of like my first actual gig but only because i didn't have a choice in the fact that i was going yeah that age you don't have much choice in what gigs you go to I don't no know. the first gig i think i actually ever chose to go to so was busted um yeah that's cool. then i took my first girlfriend to see you and me at six at the carling academy in birmingham and then yeah, yeah. the first gig by myself was ramstein oh cool yeah that's a, that's that's awesome yeah um i was just thinking about it i i have actually been to a few like more or at least more popular gigs by nature of festivals like you know where you've just got these i've been to like reading festival you know and yeah. seen like like kendrick lamar or people like that where i was just there I, I didn't pay so much to see them i was just happened to be there so i've been to a few i guess and yeah to be fair the production i remember being pretty surprised again I, at the time i was much more close-minded about music and seeing kendrick lamar i kind of thought oh, i'm not gonna like this it's not you know it's not real instruments i mean but yeah the whole band like a very 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 good band um and i was really quite enjoying it like I, you know just because it felt live it felt real you know i was thinking it was all just gonna be like backing tracks dancers and him and whatever but um but yeah it subverted expectations of my sort of pretentious self at the time who is the worst bands that you've seen live oh oh um you know whether it's in terms of whether they were just not good or whether they under delivered or yeah you know. um there's i mean there there i don't i think i'm fortunate i couldn't name any bands where i thought they were bad i, I download this year uh, i can't remember there's a band i think called the wild hearts and they just they're having problems with their monitoring uh they yeah the wild hearts walked off stage and I was like, I get you need your monitoring, right? Because they do a lot, apparently they do a lot of harmonies, right? And they need to hear. But I'm not, I'm not being funny. You, there's a point. I think you just, I wasn't there, right? I wasn't playing the gig. So I I, I don't know. But I, I like to think I would have kept playing. Uh, Evan Townsend but, used to play in the Wild Hearts. Really? Yeah, back when he was playing in the Wild Hearts, he was living in Birmingham. No way. Yeah. Wow. Moved up, onwards and upwards. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I, I don't want to kind of, I get, because it's a big event, you know, you've not played live for a year and a half and then you suddenly things aren't going right. I can see why you'd be frustrated, but I like to think I would have carried on. Um, in terms of, yeah, um, I don't think I've, there might've been a few that I maybe caught and been a bit underwhelmed by, but obviously naturally, I don't really remember who they were. Um, I remember, I do remember seeing Avenged Sevenfold and enjoying Disturbed more when they were supporting Avenged yeah um, i think naturally because avengers such a massive band like as an avenged fan and they played like one song off every album or something or like they at least got in one song from every album and i'm not the guy that listens to all of their albums so um there are quite a lot of songs i was like i don't really know what's going on here and i'm yeah. sure it was an amazing gig but i i i have to say i did leave early um because i kind of i heard a good few songs and i just i kept hearing songs i just didn't know like, i would have left early for Avenged sevenfold I do think they're good. I just, uh, yeah, I heard a few songs I liked and then and I really enjoyed Disturbed and In Flames were on the bill as well and they were good. Um, so yeah, it just got to the point where I was just like, I've seen enough. Like, yeah, they're good and I've wanted to see them for a while, but I, I need to hear more songs that I know. I was just getting a bit bored. Not because they were doing anything wrong, just because I didn't know the songs, you know. Yeah. So I guess that maybe would be my answer, you know, <laughs> probably Avenged, but not for the right reasons. Yeah, uh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Like for me, the two that really stand out for me was uh Cavell Attack when they were supporting Metallica. Oh, okay, yeah. Well, they I didn't, I don't think I caught them, I think I just there, went there to see Metallica. They were fucking dreadful, they were really bad, <laughs> did not enjoy them whatsoever. And they, um, they got fairly big now, not big, big, but like you know, I'm on a math, I'm on a math, were pretty poor. Oh, okay, I've never been a fan of theirs to be honest, I've never really liked their music. I, I only fans. saw them because I went to go and see Chorn of Bodum and um, Amon oh, okay. and Marth were supporting them and they were just dreadful. They were really bad. Yeah, I, yeah, it wouldn't... Um, I'm trying to think. It's annoying me because I'm sure I've seen some bands that I've just thought, now nah, that's rubbish, but um, I'll let you know, if I, <laughs> I'll yeah. let you know in, the, in the next however long if I think of any. But um, but yeah, Cavella, yeah, they've, they've got a bit bigger, but um, I remember seeing Metallica and I, was, I really enjoyed Metallica. Was you at the I, show in Birmingham um, then? No, I went to the O2. I went to see them in London. Uh, um, the O2. Yes, I think I remember. I think I got tickets as like a birthday present or a Christmas present, like one for me and a friend. Um, I saw then, them I in remember... Birmingham, then I saw them at the Manchester show the year after. Yeah, that's yeah. They, they, I, I, what was really funny was they were counting into a song and then they all came in. No, Lars, either Lars came in early or late. And then James turned to him and was like, 
Lars, are we doing a four count or an eight count? And Lars is like waving his hands frantically. <laughs> <laughs> when um, um, we saw them in Birmingham, literally just um, as they're about to get into the bit in one, the, oh, the, yeah. power, the power went out. Oh, no. I mean, that's kind of cool, but it's also awful. And yeah. um, what's it? Uh, Lars, come on. Lars, come on to the stage and when they got it all going and was like hey big mick are you trying to impress all your fan you know your fans in birmingham because i said big mix and from birmingham and then um rob uh, went as he warned me about this this is what happens in birmingham uh people don't pay their electric bill i know and the whole crowd just went <laughs> <laughs> that's funny no the best thing actually you know what this band wasn't bad but they did do one thing and i was like nah that's not that's just that's funny because it's just so wrong. Um, the I was watching Alter Bridge and Shinedown were supporting them. And uh, I think the singer is famously known for talking a lot. Um, and uh, and he, in the in the middle of the set, uh, and he did this, funnily enough, I saw Alter Bridge in Birmingham and London, and he did this in both cities. He says, um, uh, you know what I've heard Birmingham is known for? Respect. And everyone looked at each other like, oh, fuck off. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a lot of middle fingers and like, you know, it's like, no, Birmingham is not known for respect. And then, of course, I went to see them in London. Do you know what London's known for? And then and they were, you know, he said respect. He got a bit more of a, you know, yeah. but Birmingham, everyone was looking at each other. I heard a lot of people go like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know this place. <laughs> when um, I went to the Metallica show in Manchester, it was like, I was I was still when I was watching Metallica, I was in awe of how good Ghost were because Ghost were fucking phenomenal. Oh, I've never got the Ghost thing. <laughs> I didn't um, until I saw them live, and then I was okay. like, "Ah, the light bulb I like kind the, of." The ham, what's it? Something Hammer Square. Square Hammer. hammer. Yeah, it's a I like that. Room. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good um and then like it's only then when i kind of watched when they did the quarantine shows and they played the dvd of the metallica okay. show back in manchester live that's when i really sat back and i was like oh, okay yeah that show was amazing but there, yeah. <laughs> there was one bit i i completely didn't realize where um just before the solo being master of puppets james just goes pancakes go and i was just like <laughs> I, I i i completely didn't realize it and and then when I was, because obviously when you went to the shows in Birmingham and that, they give you the DVD or like the audio recording of the gig as part of your ticket. Yeah. And he does it in Birmingham as well. And I, I just didn't, I didn't clock on to it, but he just goes, I you in the moment, go. why would you expect, you'd have to really know he's going to say that to hear it, mm. wouldn't you? You know, um, it was yeah. such a random thing for him to, to be saying. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's fair play to him, yeah. I, um, the thing I, I, I find a bit confusing about Metallica is they do these, like, meet and greets, don't they? And you pay a lot of money for it. But then James doesn't appear, and he's, like, yeah. the biggest guy in the band. And I kind of think, like, either... I, I don't know if it's advertised as Metallica or it's advertised as... Apparently, Lars, if you... Of course, one of my friends, he's in the Met Club, and he, he enters all these right. meet and greets. And apparently, if you pay for the ticket for a meet and greet it will be lars rob and kirk but if you win the met club meet and greet james yeah. does come out for those ones apparently oh uh, okay i guess the thing is like um it's like things like i've had a couple of lessons with mark tremonti you know guitar lessons with him and they're not cheap they're about 150 pounds but then you think well if he charged 30 he'd have a few hundred people there and it wouldn't exactly, there'd be not much, be, be much point in being there. It'd just be like a conference, wouldn't it? And it's the yeah. same with James Hetfield. He's, he's bigger, he's massive, he, you know, for him to like, if he were to appear at them, God knows how many people he'd be oh, signing for. He'd be him. mad. He'd be busy as hell. So I do kind of get it, but at the same time, I think, come on, like the other guys can do it. Can you not? Like, yeah, you know, yeah. You know. The I one time I've gotten guy. really pissed off with that, and, like was one of my mates had paid 700 quid to meet Slipknot. 700, 700 quid Jesus. to meet Slipknot I, and this pay, is the joke not. this is the joke about it he got entrance in about an hour before everybody else and the Slipknot members were all there uh they were given a bag full of like goodies it's like a lighter a hat and a scarf you got a photo Crap, with basically. the band you got a photo <laughs> with the band and that was it wow over that's, he uh, said he said it was over in like 30 seconds and i was yeah, like if i quid, if yeah. i'm paying 700 quid i want at least like half an hour to speak to each member of the band 
Yeah, well, you want it, yeah, for that for that money, like, so I paid 150 quid and I had a guitar lesson with Mark Tremonti, and so I did two of them. I did one in Birmingham, and that, there were 10 of us. And that, you feel like that's, per, it's an hour, right? Always longer yeah. than that. It's probably about a couple hours all in all. He takes you around his live rig, and he shows you on stage, and he, all of that, talks you through a lot of stuff, and it's very personal. Like, you feel like you're chatting to the guy, he's actually talking to you, he feel like he wants to. Yeah, see, I, I, I would pay that. I would happily pay that. Honestly, do it. Even, I don't even, I know you're not massive on his mute, but like, I, I remember, and I, I do remember, I, uh, I, it was quite funny. The first one I did is like, oh my god, I'm going to meet my hero. I was quite nervous, you know. I don't get nervous about many things, but I was, I was a bit nervous meeting him. And uh, I remember I just we sat down. And I was just sat right next to him, and I was just like, oh my god, he's right there. He's just playing guitar next to me. Um, and uh, yeah, and I remember. Uh, but what was funny was the first one. Obviously, I was going to meet my hero, or whatever. And um, <clears throat> the, I, I'd been on holiday like the week before, and I'd rented a moped, and I managed to crash the thing. And I was just bruised up and grazed and cut and everything i looked i looked like it like I, I i just looked like i'd well i looked like i crashed a moped funnily enough um i was like great i'm gonna meet my hero i'm not even gonna be able to play guitar because my hands were all they're still like scarred from where i'd you know <laughs> it's just as well i didn't do any real damage you know it could have actually really hindered my career somewhat if i'd lost a hand um but uh but yeah and I, it's so funny and the, there's pictures of me with like a big graze on the side of my face from where i'd slammed into the floor and then uh, the moped came off worse than me, to be fair. Um, but that's, yeah, that's a bonus. That, yeah, although that's nearly as it's the worst one was I met Tony Iommi a couple of times and uh, he opened up my uni. He was there on like, and I was there in the first cohort the first year. And um, I remember going up on stage thinking it'd be pretty cool if I just rip an awesome solo and Tony Iommi walks in and just sees it. How cool would that be? Um, and I start playing and I play like the worst guitar solo of my life, genuinely, probably the worst. And then of course I look up and he's politely clapping, but like, obviously, you know, um, Oh man, that would be so embarrassing. I'm still not over that. If I can maybe like, if I can really get somewhere with this band, I'll be like, Oh, that's funny now, but yeah. it's still a bit painful. Yeah. You know? We've all uh, been in that sort of moment, haven't we? Well, we've not all cocked up in front of Tony Iommi. That's my claim to fame. But, <laughs> um, and I, I just, I hope one day, I'd like to meet him again with some status behind me and go like, Hey, look, you, you won't remember this or maybe you might, but you know, and just to, you know, if I could say like, I'm doing all right now, but yeah. back then, <laughs> you know, um, it, you'd go, to, Oh yeah, I remember. Oh, I really hope he doesn't. I don't think he will, but I, I hope he doesn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> who knows? Um, I can't say I've, I've actually got any real claim to fame. I mean, obviously, you know, knowing Rabia kind of like in, personal life is decent but I remember okay it was weird when I first met him after a Tosca show and yeah. um we were sat I was sat like chatting to him for like two hours after the gig in the flapper yeah and then like a couple of months later obviously he'd done the Daddario clinic when I got the autograph and then he oh, was, I was at that yeah 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 um and then I was going to see Tosca again and I was just sat outside having a having a beer and then all of a sudden he came and sat down and I was just like yeah. oh how's it going because he rec you know he recognized yeah, me yeah. and then like when um I saw him playing with Frog Leap and he when I was at the front of Frog Leap he'd you know he'd wait he'd waved at me when he was drumming during the Pokemon song and whatnot oh he does yeah he's a good drummer isn't he yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. he's sick I mean those yeah. are the, you know the only real claims to fame that I guess I have and yeah. that I, I played the same festival as the DJ from Pendulum that's yeah fair play that's pretty cool yeah yeah, yeah. which is is something I guess it's funny because I think I met you that when when I first met you it was as it was our first gig supporting Death Blooms. Yeah, and uh, I remember I, the reason I because that was at the Victoria, was just, wasn't it? Yeah, and I remember seeing the tattoo on your arm, and I'd seen it being shared on Beer's Instagram, and I saw it on your Goodbye arm. Goodbye going oh, on no. about like, oh, who tattooed a fucking gorilla and shit like that. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't seen that, but um, but yeah, and that's when I was like, oh, I know. I, was, I, th I think I, I remember seeing that and going, oh, I know, I've seen you, funnily. Yeah, enough, and then we got chatting about campers or whatever. God knows yeah, whatever it was. Yeah, yeah. So um, that was a good fun. Gig. It was a hot gig, but it was a good gig to be fair. It's um, a shame when like kind of like all the support bands are gone. There's only like four people that were left by for Death Blooms at the end. There weren't many of them. Yeah, they're doing well now though. Or you know, yeah, well, they played Download, didn't they? They, they got. That's the second time they played Download, didn't it? I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah, it was. Um, it, they were really great. To be fair, they played really well. 
um and it was a good really good show. lewis is another good friend of mine because i knew him he's like awesome yeah he's a nice guy my second he's our stuff as well my second ever gig with ramlide i was playing with uh lewis yeah so he's in the corn tribute isn't he? yeah corn awesome. again yeah so like me and lewis go way back <laughs> he's on yeah. the he's on the show next week so that'll be good wicked yeah, yeah 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 he's a really nice guy and he shared some of our stuff you know showed a bit of support which was awesome michael yeah. share the death and stuff or comment or whatever he's so talented he can got... he can literally do anything he's a he's a great player yeah he's got a real like attitude to him and he, he's great on stage as well you know real presence yeah he's he's awesome and um yeah he he's yeah he's he's the kind of bass player you want you know yeah <laughs> like proper proper uh proper musician proper live show as well like you know, yeah it shows that he's you know kind of a band like if you're going to be playing like a corn tribute you've got to put on a show and you've got to be a pretty good bass player because you know um there's a few iconic bass lines and that sound you know that corn there's like there's, an, you've got to there's up to it. another ramstein tribute band i'm not going to name them um but they like, the other, they're the other one though they're not yeah they're the... yeah the, the other one not <laughs> yeah. um not and the they're they're appearance is fucking awful like at least we try to look <laughs> and yeah. sound as close as we can get to Rammstein uh, but they're like they wear suits on stage when have you ever oh, seen okay. Rammstein wear suits on stage they've got like I wouldn't put it past them though <laughs> no not that they do but I wouldn't put it past them uh like they've got P like one of them's using a PRS guitar one's using a Fender and it's just okay. like I I I'm sorry but like in what way are they at all associated with so, the yeah. image? I mean, so with the tribute thing, do you do, do you try and just honour it as closely as you can, or do you try and put your own spin on it at all, or, or are you are you literally there like I just want to fully nail this, or do you so kind of like whack in your own sort of inspiration? Like before, like I guess when we were kind of getting started, we did have like a little bit more creative freedom, so to speak. Yeah. But like you know, it's it's a double-edged sword because we've gotten to the point where we are now on Ramstein's right? Are we have to yeah. pay Ramstein a fee a year to play their material, which oh, is yeah. good because it means we're on their radar, but it's a bad because we're also kind of losing some money, but it makes us more reputable. But then yeah. it kind of means like, you know, we can use like more authentic backing tracks now, you know, uh, and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Um, so we do try to be as accurate as we can, but unfortunately with how rules and regulations are with venues now, you know, we can't bring the full, like, you know, we'd have pyro units and stuff like that. We can't bring oh, yeah. as much of a full show now as, you know, yeah. as, as we could. We still have pyro, we have flash parts and we attach pyro to our arms in Dury Show Go and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like, you know, we haven't got a big fucking spunk cannon. So, yeah, so well, we've yeah, got they, um, they're known for their uh, uh, elaborate uh, yeah. props. Shall we so say. we've got like um, a snow machine that we put papa mache around to make like a dick. Um, <laughs> Who keeps uh, that? Like, what what happens when you've got friends around and they're like, how do you explain that? I think I think Adam the singer. I think he has it. Like, you know, Adam spent like over a <laughs> where grand. Do you keep, where do you keep something like that? Like, you know, <laughs> in the garage. In the, in, like, yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> out of you it's with like in the broom cupboard you know just, yeah just lying around but yeah, you know in all fairness <laughs> like adam has put a hell of a lot of effort you know he spent over a grand on his outfit he he wow. contacted the seamstress that made till's outfit and it's near mm. enough identical he's got like an identical microphone stand that's on the spring and weighs like wow. fucking like 50 kilos man it's not light at all Jesus. um yeah. and he really does bring that you know aspect i mean not like my aspect is having the signature guitars and you know and whatnot yeah. but yeah i suppose you got to if you really want to be true don't you, you gotta, um you gotta have them. we get uh, you know as as close as we can for what we can do whereas like some of the ones in germany they have like ramstein's leftover stage props and stuff like that oh, okay yeah but we, we, we can't compete with that so we do what we can do yeah yeah i just i just get i guess just do the best you can that it shows when you're doing the best i mean our keyboard this spends the whole gig on a treadmill so that's something <laughs> that's that's some hefty work i couldn't do that 
Yeah, he, he looks the treadmill that. around in the on the like the back of his uh in his uh estate car and like we always like have a, a little That's wager brilliant. on how many uh kilometers he's covered during the gig. And Surely it's not always, always roughly the same, or unless he gets a run on him or whatever. He's usually about five k, just four or five k of walking <laughs> on the stage, and he's there proper doing like the the flake walk and stuff. It, it's it's, good, it's it's good fun. It's it's a really good gig to be fair. Yeah, that sounds great fun. Yeah, I um, yeah, I, f- I suppose you get yeah, you just get to enjoy the music because obviously if it's your own like if it's your own music, you know, there's there's a lot. I suppose you still got to put a lot of time into learning a lot of the songs, but like. I, I, yeah i feel like it's there for you to enjoy isn't it if it's if i, I feel double. kind of cheated in a way because my first ever band was bram Lloyd. you know what I, I, yeah. I saw them in birmingham i got chatted to them they'd seen me doing covers of ramstein and their guitarist was leaving and they're like do you want to do an audition for us so i was like oh yeah. <laughs> hell yeah um and then like two weeks later i'm playing down in bournemouth then you know, up in Manchester, then playing a festival for my third gi- third ever gig. And it was yeah. kind of like, it was very surreal. And I guess like it's the only band that I've played in live. Yeah. So kind of like now dipping into the original scene, it, you know, so to speak, it, it is very different because as a, you know, as a tribute artist, let's be honest, you're guaranteed a gig. You are guaranteed yeah. to sell X amount of tickets. You know, we... Yeah, 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 you know, thankfully we're at the point where we can pretty much name a fee and we'll get it because it's like okay, well if you're not going to do it, another venue will sort of thing. Yeah, um, and you're always guaranteed a good a good sellout crowd. You know, don't get me yeah. wrong, there's been venues where it's been absolutely fucking dog shit, and yeah, <laughs> um, but you know, this this there are the lows that come with the highs, um, and it's going to be a very different thing to go into now playing into an originals band where you don't have that crowd singing along you don't have that crowd participation in do hast and so it's going to be very different yeah so you've got to bring a different feel i guess yeah it's a different it's just a whole other a whole other ball game because um it's uh sorry i just sorry <laughs> i just saw a bus go past me with uh advertising sti kits and the, the headline was just chlamydia and it just totally threw me off i'll be honest <laughs> it's, it's, yeah there's one on the train station on the way to work and it says hard to spell easier to catch and I'm like, that's what i want to see when i'm going into work <laughs> yeah yeah I'll be, just, it just it went right past my window big lettering it was like i can't I totally lost my train of thought. It's like, I have to say that, otherwise I just look like a mong now. It looks like... <laughs> <laughs> What's like been I've looking out for the last all of a like 20 seconds? <laughs> Clemidia. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, an interesting change of conversation. But... It's like, I think, like, I was, when I've been chatting to the guys, like, you know, my pet peeve and seeing enough, like, you know, original bands that have supported speaking us Speaking of Clemidia, my pet peeve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> looking for an advertisement with Jurex um, is <laughs> seeing like in the amount of like, you know, original bands that turn up like in their jeans and a t-shirt and they make no effort whatsoever to try and give themselves a persona and an image. Yeah. Like I'm already thinking, okay, how can I have this band have an image how can they have a persona to give that presence because i feel like every band now you know just will turn up in their saturday you know jeans and t-shirt play the gig and that's it you know don't there's the music but you've also got to have an image to go with the music i always think yeah we um i was chatting to uh, uh an artist manager a while ago and he, he was saying about how uh You've got to take the audience somewhere else with your bit, with your music, with your live show, whatever. They they've got a a lot of why people listen to music is that they they want to be taken somewhere else mentally, you know. And I think yeah, if you can do that, I mean we we're not like we uh, we started off a bit like oh we just kind of wear what we want. We try and be a bit more coordinated now. Um, yeah. I don't we don't we kind of we don't have an image as such, you know. We don't really have a um you know like if you took like Slipknot or Ramstein or you know we we. I, I feel like we don't want to go too far down the theatrical route. Um, I feel like that would be um, disingenuous given the, the type of music we do. Yeah, but it wouldn't um, work. Like it's not, our music isn't aggressive enough to be like, for us to be all dressed all bloodied up and tattered and torn, you know, like yeah. we couldn't look like that. Um, for us to 
look anything other than trying to be ourselves i think we need to try and be ourselves but still look the part basically i think because that's kind of what the music does it's it's us trying to deliver hopefully quite an emotionally powerful message and i think to try and be someone else behind that you know this is one little problem i have sleep token right they have this whole anonymity in this like um sort of uh what, what is it the, the whole the vessel is the name of the singer or whatever you know yeah and, um but to me, like the songs, the, con the lyrical content of the songs is often about like, you know, love or like, uh, or loss or, or, or it's quite personal stuff. It's things that like have a face, you know, it's emotional and they're singing about these, you know, people, you know, I don't, unless I'm missing some of the meanings behind these songs. I think there's one song, um, there's a song called Sugar, which, um, I, I think is probably about some sort of drug addiction. Um, but he sort of makes parallels with like, you know, with a girl or whatever he wants to do involved with in some way um and uh, you know having some sort of addiction i think that's what the song's about but either way these are quite personal co topics and to be singing them without even showing your face to me is a bit yeah. dishonest and i think either take the masks off and show your faces and show that you're singing about something real or keep the mask on and sing and, and be a bit more cryptic about what you're singing about try and really like weave in some meanings that aren't so personal maybe take a grander scale approach talk about society talk about like um you know we sing about sort of society we try and tie it into the personal you know how that affects us as people and i feel like that's kind of something that is you know you need yeah. to show your face for and i feel like with sleep token it's like their songs what they sing about has that emotion has a it it, it, it has a face it has a, a feeling to it and i think yeah. to take your face away from that and to be anonymous i think it's just a bit of a gimmick um some I bands wrong, i guess some well, bands but... work with the gimmick don't they i mean you take ghost for example yeah. you know they have yeah you know it's very theatrical and that works yeah and it's like when i when i saw them i was i was quite transfixed and you know like i knew tobias four which was obviously mm -hmm. the cardinal but obviously unless you know you don't know who anybody else is in the yeah. band yeah Unless yeah. you you know you know people in the know sort of thing, and it was very transfixing. Like everybody looked the same, you know. As much as like Slipknot wear masks, we know who they are off the camera. They're very open about yeah. it. Whereas with Ghost, they're not. You know, it is yeah. very you know, anon anon. An, I don't know how to say the word an anonymous an, anonymous anonymously an anemone. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Sorry, my dyslexia is getting in the way. Of that. Yeah, um, it's all right. <laughs> and, you know, I only know um, who one of the members is. And he, he lives up, yeah. ironically, he lives up in Yorkshire. Um, yeah. And has played... Uh, of, uh, of, of Ghost? Yes. Oh, okay. And he, yeah. uh, with for those that don't want to know, he did, did or does play in Sisters of Mercy. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. So, um, and I've seen him selling various bits of guitar gear on on Facebook. Yeah, he lives up in Yorkshire, <laughs> like, and then like that when... really takes away from the thrill of it. I'll be honest. <laughs> well, it is yeah, because like you feel uh, like he's got to be from like Atlantis or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's Yorkshire. like um, when you see him on stage and he's got all the same jewelry on and stuff like that, and you go, ah, it, it, it kind of clicks. But that, it, that connects you with him personally, whereas like Sleep Token, I just think I, I'm just like the latest song is a brilliant song, and it's talking about that. It's basically talking about a girl. He's saying she's this, she's that, and then but you can't even see his face, and it just to me, it's a bit. There's a bit of a disconnect there in there. I in guess Taller like that in his way because Maynard doesn't really like to be in the forefront, does he? And Tall, he's happy to he sit kind sits of back live. Yeah, yeah. Saying that, like I've been, yeah. I've, I've been you know i mean it's tall anyway but like i've been transfixed on um have you seen the drum cover well it's a drum cover the drum play through of danny carey doing numa yes. and yeah with his, I, oh, yeah. i'm in a thing like that i'm watching that every day and every time i watch it i i spot something new that he's doing There's always something to spot with his playing he's a phenomenal drummer i um the only thing with his drumming, and I think it's just the nature of Tool, and it's nothing, it's no critique of him, is that sometimes, you know, obviously drummer's there to deliver the groove, and sometimes I feel like the, it's so, not technical, but just so involved and so ever developing that you sometimes lose just that consistent, just groove that you want. And that's, but that's just Tool, that's not really him as such, I think, to be fair. And the um, good thing with that's Tool That's the only is... thing is him. 
um, he hides the time signatures extremely well. Yes. I love Jambi, the way that comes in, uh, the, the way the kick drum starts to come in. And it just, you know, it's in what, nine or something. Uh, yeah. The way that kick drum comes in in Jambi, I just think is awesome. It's like 9.13 like, or you know, something it's... fucking ridiculous like that. It's in a, it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it was nine, eight. Yeah. It's, but it, it's a weird, um, it's, it's, it's not, it's not, it sounds weirder than it is. Cause obviously counting nine isn't actually that tricky. No, but it just, something about it just feels quite, it is, it's yeah, like, it's a brilliant. I, I the try tone, and learn oh, the guitar it. tone on that as well. Oh yeah. Uh, it's like when you're learning the, dugga, 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 like trying to learn oh, that yeah. pattern was fucking difficult at times. Oh yeah, that yeah. I've not really learned many. I don't think I've learned any tool songs to be fair. I know them quite well. Um, I've learned uh, Schism, Numa. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jambi. I'm trying to learn Tempest. Um, Stinkfist is a good one. Yeah, Stinkfist is another good one. Uh, Bottom's a good one. Prison Sex. Um, Lateralis, obviously. Those are interesting names, don't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think yeah, Jam Jambi's probably one of my favourite. What that Stinkfist Lateralus. Uh I'm I'm not big on their latest album. I've not really given it the time that it deserves, probably, but Tempest and Numa. The, 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 the time that it the time that it deserves is annoyingly quite a lot of time because it's just, this is some long songs. Yeah. Um, it was I have to say, like, I was really hyped up for it. And then when it did come out, I did feel very sort of like, uh, that was it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was I was hyped as well to be fair, and I just I don't know. I feel like if I were a massive Tool fan, probably yeah, it would have delivered. But I'm as a as a like a, a sort of a what's the word like a not so avid listener, just like a, a, an That's enjoyer sure. of their music. Yeah, a casual listener of their music. Yeah, like I do like it, but I, I, I wasn't. Yeah, I had to be hooked on that. I had there had to be something there that just like hooked me in, and there wasn't really from that album for me. Mm um and especially when the songs are 10 minutes long it's like if you're not hooking me in like ain't gonna work listen to 10 minutes of that might listen to three not listen to 10 you know yeah sorry i get what you mean i get what you mean yeah right yeah. I've, I've this has been like near enough an hour and a half already it's been so yeah, we've sounds... we've flown through um yeah, yeah, we yeah. probably didn't even get to talk yeah. about half the topics that i kind of actually sort of planned amazingly that's all good. i think that's what these are for isn't it i guess yeah, man. you know otherwise it might have been a, might as well have been a three minute interview you know so. <laughs> um so i'm going to start wrapping it up by obviously doing the same three questions as i ask every guest on the, the podcast cool. it's a running theme so the first question is um I've, i nearly forgot what i was going to ask but on your desert island rig you have one guitar one pedal and yeah. one amp no budget what are you taking with you uh i am taking my prs that's what i'm taking amp oh okay that's tricky um uh i want to take a punt and just say like i oh i really like my prs archon that i had that was awesome and i'm keen to try the new ones um i'm tempted to say the bogner ecstasy i think uh yeah i'm gonna go with that i'm gonna go with that um and then pedal I'm not going to say tuner because I can tune by ear if I'm on my own. Like it doesn't matter if I'm not in tune with E standard or whatever. So <laughs> I won't say that. As long as the guitar is in tune with itself, it's all right. Um, pedal, uh, uh, probably a wah, just because like it gives you that extra expression that like sometimes you just need. Uh, and I think like yeah, it'd be cool to have like another distortion or another uh, you know effect or something. Or oh, maybe a verb or a delay. Oh, it might be a bit dead without one of them. Probably a re, probably like a Strymon Blue Sky or a Big Sky Reverb or something like that. So I've just got at least an infinite number of reverbs that I can have. So well, I can do clean and leads without it sounding really dry. Yeah, reverb, be a reverb pedal. And if you put While the reverb to a really fun. short, like a uh, short mix, you can yeah, turn it into a delay. A delay, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I'm sure I could figure that out. That's what I feel like that's cheating a bit. So I'll just go with a reverb. You know, I'll go with the Blue Sky Reverb. That way, I don't have to mess around with all the weird settings and that. So that'd that's be yeah, that's, yeah, that'd be my rig. PRS, my PRS, Bogner Ecstasy and a blue sky. That's a nice, that's a nice little uh nice little rig to have there. Nice style as well, yeah. Uh secondly, uh what are you listening to at the moment on your preferred streaming platform? Oh, okay. 
Uh, so there's a few. I've been listening to the new Sleep Token song, funnily enough, after shitting on them for 10 minutes. Um, I've been listening to uh, Lotus Eater. They are oh, yes. heavy, heavy as balls, and they're good. Um, I've been listening to Alluvial. They're just awesome. They just... Uh, the Wes House guitar playing is next level. Uh, the, the solos, the riffs, the grooves, just awesome. Um, I'm sure I'm going to miss something, so I'm actually... I've, I can get... I'm just going to have a look at my very, very, very brief look through my playlist. Um, yeah, a bit more Meshuggah recently. Uh, Bleed From Within. Yeah. Uh, bit, bit of Spirit Box. I, I quite like them. Um, yeah, those, in terms of new stuff, I, I always listen to like Alter Bridge, Slipknot, whatever, Gajira. Um, there are loads of like uh, bands I listen to regularly, but in terms of new stuff, those are probably the ones that I'm hot on at the moment. Wicked. That's a nice little uh, proggy, heavy mix. Yeah, it's proggy, but it's also just straight up heavy in parts. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a good mix. It's a good mix. Uh, and lastly, where can we find out more about you and your music? Cool. Uh, so, Insurgent is the name of the band, in case you know, anyone sort of missed that. Um, so, we're on, you know, we're on all our streaming platforms. We're on, uh, on all the social media. If you search Insurgent, you know, I'm sure it'll come up. I mean, we're like, I think Instagram, we're Insurgent Music. We're then Insurgent Band on Facebook. We want to make them all the same, but it's really awkward because, like, there's some bullshit Insurgent Band somewhere else. And, oh, God. Um, and then there's, yeah, we're like, uh, yeah, so we're on all the socials. Um, check me out on Instagram, I'm Joe underscore Rowley underscore 97. That's where I do all my. Just I don't I haven't done much on there recently, but you know let's keep up to date. I post stories and stuff. I'll be posting a few more, a lot well a lot more actually, um, once all this music is fully released and that. Um, so yeah, I think that's about it. YouTube, check out the videos or video at the moment. More to come, but um, yeah, Insurgent on YouTube. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, we're just on all the standard stuff if you search Insurgent, and I don't think there are some. There's another Insurgent who I think is like a DJ, but. I don't think we'll be confused with him too soon. So no, it's a com- okay. c- quite a uh, genre jump, I think. Yeah, I think you'd be a bit confused if you landed on that and thought that was me. <clears throat> so, yeah. Some big seven foot black guy or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know who I don't know who he is, but but um, he's got a few streams, not loads, but not quite yeah. the same. Yeah, not quite. <laughs> so, Joe, it's been an absolute delight and an absolute yeah, pleasure really having you it. on the show. Yeah. It's took a while to get you on because this, that, and the other, but it's certainly been yeah, really yeah. good to get you on here. It's no, been I've an absolute it. delight. Nice. nice to chat all things guitar and uh, hear a few new... Oh, this, I've got a few bands to check out now, to be fair, so I shall do that. Yeah, and I think I, I think you'll be sending some my way and I'll be sending some your way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're going to do yeah. a playthrough for us at the end of this podcast, yep. so make sure, viewers and listeners, that you don't go anywhere because you're not going to want to miss this. So I am very much looking forward to hearing and watching that. So don't forget to check out Joe and Insurgent in the links below. So you'll be able to check out Insurgent's music. Make sure you download or buy their EP. Have a good listen to it. Buy it. Buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it, buy it. Buy it. <laughs> Give me money. <laughs> exactly. And or, or buy Joe's guitar lessons. Oh, yeah, definitely that, yeah. I'm, sh- I'm sure <laughs> it would be... more money in that. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be worth the money and you can get to see him use his PRS and his strat. You do. So make sure you check Joe out. Make sure you check Insurgent out. You can check me out on Instagram at the Corona Mortis. Make sure you find Guitar Geeks on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Amazon Alexa, on Anchor, and all other streaming platforms. You can also find Guitar Geeks on YouTube by putting in that search bar, Guitar Geeks. Make sure you like and subscribe and share this post comment who you would like to see on the podcast next and i'm sure we can arrange getting them onto the show so joe thank you again once again for being on the show and to all you listeners and watchers we'll see you all again very soon